Um, so today's um, Bionomarco workshop uh, is on collecting and analyzing protein backbone dynamics. So uh, basically there are three different experiments one needs to run, and that is the T1, T2, and NOE experiment. And uh, this is a NMR-based technique. Um, so this is also called a relaxation technique. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the whole um, uh, idea behind this workshop is to actually go behind um, some theory uh, um, of why you're running these experiments, how to successfully set it up on top spin. And then uh, we will um, actually um, uh, set up um, the data uh, and also analyze the data, get uh, the fitted values, and then we can do um, some analysis based on those fitted values using something called model tree analysis. Um, so this is a very top uh, down overview of what we're going to do today. Um, so basically um, this is, um, Okay, uh, so basically this webinar is being recorded. This is the first time I'm doing a webinar. So mostly I do uh, Zoom meetings. So this will be interesting. And um, this is uh, going to go on the website as well. So um, basically you can refer to this later. Um, so again, these are optional for hosts and participants, uh, the webcams. And um, uh, if you're given opportunity to speak on stage, that's fine. Um, make sure that your mic is muted and not be aware of that. And uh, feel free to ask any questions in Q&A panel, raise your hand um, so we can, um, either me or Minli can give you the opportunity to speak, ask questions. You can stop me any, any time. It, it, there's no um, requirement for me to finish whatever is actually uh, every slide for you to ask questions. You can ask at any point of time and uh, feel free to raise your hands. So that way um, if you have any questions, we can actually address those things on the spot. Um, so basically, uh, the background behind um, today's uh, T1, T2, NOE experiments, uh, why do we actually care, right? So basically, proteins are dynamic in nature. Um, so this uh, PDB, the 2NA2, is actually one of the structures that I solved when I was a postdoc. Um, so this is very interesting. So basically, there are 20 ensemble structures uh, that kind of like um, makes up this particular protein. So um, the PDB structure is this. Uh, so PDB structure is actually three-dimensional structure of um, the, the protein. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the three-dimensional structure uh, defines the exact coordinates. So what you will see here that is on the left-hand side is that not just one structure fits all the NMR data that we have collected. There are probably slight variations in each of these structures that are uh, denoted using the spaghetti structure on the left. Um, and then these variations um, are totally fine in terms of the data that is collected. There are no violations in any data that we collected, but then because of the internal motions or there could be so many different things going on in the protein that gives rise to these variations in the loop regions, the end of the protein, the C terminus, N terminus. So a lot of things can contribute to this. Some of them are imperfections in data or incompleteness in a lot of constraints. So basically sometimes the ends don't have very good uh, constraints, the N terminus and the C terminus. And it's a stochastic process, right? So basically th this kind of like uh, is totally acceptable. And in terms of the NMR technique, we have multiple ensembles that can fit the, the same data. So we do something called simulated annealing to get to the structure. So that is why uh, you could end up with various different um, final solutions. And uh, the other fact is that proteins are dynamic in nature. And probably that is why you're running these experiments is to study why they are dynamic or which portions are dynamic. Um, so um, the, the dynamics can be defined at different time scales. Um, so there could be motions that happen in the second time scale. There could be motions happening in millisecond to microsecond uh, time scales. And these are very important, especially for um, uh, basically uh, the proteins that are involved in a lot of enzymes. Um, so enzymatic processes are in the millisecond time scale. So basically these motions 
once you study, could directly be attributed to the enzymatic uh, mechanisms as well. So that is why people are very, very interested in this microsecond to millisecond time scale. And that is what T1, T2, T1 gives you. And then there are also fast motions as well, um, nanosecond to picosecond time scale, and these are like side chain motions and stuff like that. So these dynamics uh, can be uh, like uh, dependent on uh, when you change the temperature, there are like energy barriers between uh, two different states. And also each um, uh, substrate that it binds to could affect its dynamics. That is these millisecond microsecond dynamics could change when it binds to its binding partner and stuff like that. Um, so basically the next slide you probably have seen millions of times if you have ever, ever attended any NMR talk. Uh, so the top portion is where there are different like overall top kind of like what people are interested in, kind of like biological questions. Um, then the second is the local structural change. So basically anything related to folding, domain motions, molecular tumbling, side chain rotations, all that um, are in a wide uh, time scale that goes all the way from like 10 to power minus 15 seconds to the second time scale. Um, so the one in the bottom that you see there are the different NMR experiments that you can run. Um, so if you're not uh, familiar with these uh, uh, experiments, come talk to me, talk to Minli. Uh, we are here to help you set up these experiments. And we're going to talk about this tiny little area in this whole um, time scale. So that is probably this guy. So we will, we will probably look in the domain motion uh, region and look at uh, this particular region to actually get idea about um, the, the dynamics in the microsecond to you know um, millisecond time scale. Okay. So let's uh, look at chemical exchange. So let's say there are two states. So what I mean by motion that is dynamics is actually, let's say there are two different uh, states. Um, there's a state A, state B, and probably the protein is um, moving or like experiencing state A and B uh, at different time points. And this uh, rate is defined by K um, and the inverse that is from B to A is defined by K minus one. So let, just for simplicity for the first part, let's just assume that they are the same. That is K one and K minus one are the same, which means you know it experiences state A and state B um, for the same amount of time. Um, so it spends 50% of the time in A, 50% of the time in B. So what, what it means is the average time spent in each of these state is one over K, right? So basically that, that is just, you know, uh, the kinetics of uh, the populations of each of these states. So basically if there are two different signals coming from state A and state B, and if the exchange between that, that is the K value is actually uh, in the slow exchanging regime, uh, you will see uh, the difference in uh, chemical shifts uh, for each and every state. That is, you're going to see signals from state A uh, as well as signals from state B. And we call that as slow exchange. Um, so that is the, uh, the left side of this figure. And the right side of the figure is actually fast exchange. In that case, um, the rate of exchange is much, 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 much faster than the difference in absolute chemical shift between uh, these experiments. What does this mean? That means that probably if you go to a higher uh, magnetic field, uh, you will experience slow exchange because you are actually changing. See the value that is shown here is in Hertz, right? So the moment you go to a higher field, you're going to see a higher um, J coupling between the two states. So which means that you will push the equilibrium of what your, whatever you, your state that you're looking at to the slow exchange. So the moment you go to a lower field, so let's say you are collecting data on 800 and you go to a 600, you, if you're seeing something that is an intermediate exchange, uh, you can actually push it towards slow, uh, fast exchange. That is the right-hand side of the spectrum. So you will start seeing just one signal, which is the population average between the state A and state B. So basically what this means is it makes your life much, much, much easier. Um, you, what you do want to do is either push your system into fast exchange or slow exchange. So we have different techniques to actually uh, measure these processes in either of those states. 
But what you don't want to be at is in the middle, that is the intermediate exchange. So the problem with the intermediate exchange is there are various different processes that are actually states that this guy can, that is the populations of um, the protein could be in various degrees um, all the way from VA to actually VB. So the chemical shifts for these two states. And that would mean that you have tremendous line broadening and that is not good. So once you see something like that, you either go to a lower field uh, with the similar capabilities or you go to a higher field so that you push it to slow exchange. So in today's um, whole uh, process, we're going to talk about the fast exchange. Let's forget uh, slow exchange for today. Um, so we have other techniques to actually study slow exchanging processes. So our assumption is that our protein that we're trying to study is towards the right-hand side of this, uh, this figure. Um, so basically what we are pretty much interested in is the half height line width. So what this means is let's say you have a peak, uh, you just find out what the height of that peak is, go to the half of that, and then you can actually measure the half height line width. So once you measure this half height line width, you can actually determine um, the average time that this, this particular residue is experiencing in each of these states, as I'm assuming that there are just two states and then they experience um, these two states in fast exchange and then they are in equal population. Then you get um, easily, uh, you just divide that uh, uh, number by uh, pi and you will get the average amount of time that is spent over there. So this kind of gives you a um, very, very crude way of looking at dynamics. So you have probably run these. So if you run an HSQC experiment, you are pretty much uh, collecting uh, one signal that corresponds to your residue of interest. And what you can do is you can quickly look at that. That is like a quick way to look at things is to actually go and find what the half height is, then try to measure the line width. And that will give you the approximate time that, um, or I can say it's an approximate T2 value for your, um, for your protein of interest. Um, then you can do this for every residue in your HSQC peak, and you will see that they're pretty much similar um, for the rigid portions of, the re of your protein and the dynamic portions could be a little broader. So you'll have a higher um, line width for those residues. So basically this is like a very quick way to actually run uh, a T or like T2 analysis on the protein of interest. But again, this is not, you know, like a publishable value. So basically in order to publish T1, T2 or like T2 values, you probably have to run the experiments that I'm going to show today. <clears throat> okay, so that was a very big assumption that, hey, you know, this protein probably experiences A and B states equally. That may not be the case. So you might have two different rate constants, so KA and KB. So what would happen when you have something like this um, so let's say there is like two different states, right? A, the, the state A that is on the left-hand side and state B that's on the right-hand side. And uh, the, the, the fast exchange process, you will see a peak that is the population average between these two states. So let's say in this case, you're experiencing much higher populations of state B. Um, so basically that means that KA is faster than KB. So that means that your signal will be much, much, much closer to the state B than compared to state A. And that is the population average. That is the left-hand side of this figure. And the right-hand side of the figure, if this was in slow exchange, then um, based on the spectrometer that you select to run your experiments, you will start seeing things uh, wherein the signal intensity of each of these uh, states, that is state A is going to be population averaged uh, for state A versus state B. So the total population is going to be some of the heights of A and B, that is the left-hand side of this, uh, the figure that you're seeing here. Again, you don't want to be in the intermediate exchange. Very, very broad peaks, that, that's not good. So basically uh, we are again on the right-hand side of this figure. Um, so this is like a generalized way of looking at what you're look, the signals that you're looking at. So, Longitudinal relaxation requires the time dependent magnetic field uh, to be fluctuating at the Lama frequency. Um, and then the time dependence originates um, in the motions of the molecules. So basically you have all these kinds of like vibration, rotations, diffusions, and that is what creates these kind of like variations in the different states. 
and then um, the the molecules tend to tumble, and that is what is defined, or what um, in NMR term we call this rotational correlation time or tau c. So from now on, when I say tau c, that is what it means. It means rotational correlation time. So what does tau c? You probably probably seen in a lot of papers, right? Tau c, tau c, tumbling time. So what what does it mean? It just means that um, it is the time needed for the deflection of molecule, that is the rotation of the molecule to be like around one radian. So the, think of it like a cone of 60 degrees. So if it moves anywhere outside of that cone, that is the time that it required for it to move out of the cone uh, of 60 degree from uh, the starting point. So basically that means that if it is a bigger molecule, the tumbling time is going to be slower um, because it, it'll probably is much, much, much bigger. So it takes a lot of time to actually tumble. Small molecules tumble much faster. So your tau C is much, much, much high, uh, higher. Okay. Um, so uh, actually tau C is much smaller for small molecules. Um, so basically that is, what, that is what tau C is. And this rotational diffusion um, occurs in a quite a big range of frequency. And one hour tau C is your average rotational um, frequency. And basically this tau C can be actually um, described um, as an angular frequency that is this, this beautiful thing called spectral density function, and that is JW. So from now on, this is what we are interested in. We want to get the spectral density function. And as you can see, the spectral density function is dependent on tau C and it's also uh, dependent on the angular frequency of the spins that you're interested in. Um, so this is a very generalized uh, formalism of spectral density function. And uh, I will show you how this is important for various processes. So uh, let's say you have a frequency distribution of uh, various processes that are happening. Let's say fast motion, intermediate motion, and slow motion. And basically um, th those can be defined uh, uh, by this uh, spectral density function. And then we um, have a spectral density function for T1. So one over T1 is defined as R1. So that is the equation one that you have. Um, so anytime you see something that describes R1, that is one over T1, R2 is one over T2. So that is, that is what these acronyms mean. And then the NOE is down in the bottom. So that is just the ratio. So basically what I'm trying to show here is that there is a relationship between um, R1 and the spectral density function. R2 and spectral density function and NOE and also um, the, the NOE enhancement because of this spectral density function. So what this means is that if you're able to collect this R1 or T1 or R2 or T2 or NOE enhancement, uh, you can actually uh, get some idea about the, spec uh, the spectral density function. And I'll, I'll show you how we can do that. So the whole idea is so the left-hand side of this figure is actually collecting these, um, these experiments. So these experiments uh, are your T1 experiments, and they are based on your magnetization that I have uh, listed over here. So it could be an NX magnetization and Y magnetization and Z. Um, then you have your HZ and Z. So all these like multiple quantum terms uh, can be used as well. Uh, but in our case, we are just going to use X, Y, and, and Z. And we can do something called a spectral density mapping in order to back calculate the spectral density functions. So the beauty about uh, once you do the mapping is that you can actually correlate the protein motions uh, based on the various states that it experienced back into spectral density function. So basically you can do um, this uh, fitting process wherein you fit the spectral, oh, sorry. So you fit the spectral density function and then you can back calculate based on the amount of motions that you have in your protein and then you can uh, adjust the, the fitting and then do the calculation back and forth to actually try to get a good fitting for the spectral density function based on the experimental values on the left-hand side of this figure. And then you can actually back calculate what the T1 value or T2 value or the NOE enhancement is based on spectral density function. So it's an iterative process. I will go over that process uh, very soon. Uh, but this is uh, the overview of what we are trying to do. We are trying to collect NMR data that is on the left-hand side of this uh, figure. And on the right-hand side of the figure, what we have is protein motion. So that is what we are interested in. And uh, we are the intermediate in between these two is that spectral density function. 
So we're going to do some spectral density mapping, and then we can actually back calculate that from these motions for protein. So yeah, so this is very, very important. So this is exactly what we are trying to do. And this is, um, uh, this is like, you know, the key of what we are trying to get from these experiments. And then uh, of course the rotational correlation time is dependent on T1, T2, NOE. This is actually the plot of all the, the equations that I showed you two slides ago, showing that, hey, there are different contributions from this T1, T2, NOE. So you just can't get away with just collecting T1 or T2, depending on where you are in terms of your rotational correlation time, it could have different effects on these processes. That is, uh, if you just collected T1, you may not be able to get um, appropriate fitting once you are in a higher tumbling time, that is the right-hand side of the spectrum. But if you have collected T2 as well, then that is good. Uh, you can get a better idea of what spectral density functions are. And then you, if you also collect an NOE enhancement, you can actually um, get a much better fit for the data. So the, what I'm trying to show here is every one of these experiments is important to back calculate your uh, spectral density function. Again, um, this is like a very generalized view of what the spectral density mapping is. Uh, remember I said, hey, you can collect your data and then correlate that to your uh, J of uh, omega. Um, so, so basically that is what these equations uh, mean over here. So the idea behind doing these experiments is to actually get this uh, relation between the spectral density function and the collected um, value. So here you can actually see the, the user has uh, put in the equation where it is R1, which is one over T1. Um, that is the equation on the top and the middle one is R2. And the next one is the NOE enhancement. And then you can um, fit uh, for the collected data based on this. So basically these are the three different experiments that we're going to do. Um, so the, the top experiment is the T1 experiment the middle experiment is the T2 experiment, and the last one is the NOE enhancement experiment. This is not the NOE that you run, this is a different experiment. So this just looks for enhancement based on um, the NOE, uh, that is the uh, proximity of uh, hydrogen atoms around the nitrogen of interest. So the base of these experiments are HSQC, so don't be intimidated by what you're looking at. We will go over these experiments now and we will just see what is happening in these experiments. Um, but um, I just want to um, give an overview of what is happening. So um, in the first T1 experiment, well, when someone says, hey, I want to collect T1, they're actually trying to find out what the Z magnetization, that is relaxation of the Z magnetization. Okay, um, so what does that mean? So Z, uh, so, um, Z magnetization is the magnetization along the, the magnet um, that is, um, it goes above the ground. And the XY plane is actually the plane that you're standing on. So basically that is that T2 experiment that gives us that value. Um, and then um, the NOE kind of uh, gives us, uh, the enhancement gives us um, the effect of other protons that are close by to the magnetization that uh, we are interested in. And in this case, we are looking at the N15 magnetization. So when I say, hey, we are measuring T1, T2, NOE um, uh, relaxation, we are looking at N15, uh, T1, T2, and N15 um, NOE enhancement. Um, so what, uh, why are we interested? Because all proteins have N15, uh, so nitrogen in them, and then that nitrogen is connected to the amide hydrogen. So the first step of this experiment is actually to use the HSQC as the base of this experiment. This is slightly uh, different from what you are actually running, but yeah, th this is a very good example of, uh, or an overview of what is happening. So let's go one experiment, um, uh, uh, like let's first look at the T1 experiment, then we'll look at T2, and then we'll look at NOE experiment. Okay, so I have grayed out the middle portion and that is your uh, T1 portion of your experiment. Everything other than this is actually is as building blocks. So every NMR experiment will have something called as a preparation period. Then you'll have something called as chemical shift labeling region of your spectrum, uh, of your experiment. Then you'll actually refocus your magnetization. So that is the next portion of your 
uh, NMR experiment. And the last is your acquisition or you acquire your data. Okay, so any NMR experiment that you take will have these different blocks, okay? Um, so basically some experiments could have smaller preparation periods, different preparation periods, different magnetization transfers and stuff like that. So basically the idea behind any experiment is this. Um, and the ones that I, now that I removed uh, the one in the middle that is I just blocked out over here. So what does that mean? It, this is now an HSQC experiment. So if you just remove that middle portion, you have a preparation label refocus acquire. Okay, so this is your uh, standard HSQC experiment. Um, so uh, different papers um, can actually use the second that is N15 as S magnetization. So you'll have an hydrogen magnetization that is the top line over there and the nitrogen or S magnetization is over here. And sometimes uh, hydrogen is also called as I. So you'll see some I, X, I and S, and then you will see sometimes some papers refer to this as um, H and N, okay? Um, in in uh, my case, I'm just going to refer these as H and N, so it makes our life much, much, much easier. Okay, so let's look at the preparation period, right? So preparation period, you will see there are like two blocks. Uh, let's forget about the first, uh, the first thing on the N15. So you will see that there is a 90, 180. So anything that is a thin line is a 90. Anything that's a thick line is a 180. And then um, anything that is written as an X or Y is actually a thing that you apply along that axis. So if there is nothing written on top of it, it just means it's an X magnetization, okay? Um, so basically there are two regions in here in the preparation period. Um, so basically, let's see if I can annotate, okay. Okay, I can annotate. Uh, let's do undo, okay. Um, so basically, um, so this is where your experiment starts, okay? Um, so over here, and then uh, this whole thing is an inept period. This whole thing is an inept period. See, they look pretty much the same, right? So you have a 90, 180, 90 um, on one axis, and then you have uh, nothing, 180, nothing, right? So the same thing, 90, 180, 90 over here, and then nothing, 180, 90. Right, so think of this as no chemical shift evolution happens. So just take this uh, as a word because you know I, I don't want to go over why you're actually not evolving chemical shifts over here, uh, but you evolve something called a scalar coupling. Scalar coupling is something that happens only if hydrogen is connected to nitrogen. So in our, in our case, we have our amide um, uh, bond between hydrogen and nitrogen every residue has it. Uh, so that means that in the first inner period, okay, so you are actually transferring the magnetization from the hydrogen to the nitrogen. So, so you build up this particular term, okay? So basically you're going to have something called HZ and Y. So this particular magnetization is present at this point of time. And again, when you do a second inept, what happens is this magical thing happens. That is this HZ, that is, the original magnetization that you started with just vanishes and you end up with something called as an NX magnetization, okay? So if you were to do the T2 experiment, you will just start from here, okay? So we will, we will look at that uh, very soon, but because we want to get to this NZ magnetization, okay? Um, so what we do is we apply a Y pulse. So the moment you have an X and you apply a Y pulse, you actually use the right hand rule and you will get uh, like an NZ or a minus NZ magnetization at this point of time. And that's it. So this is what you're happening. So basically when, once you see any pulse program that has these two inaps, you're pretty much creating that is a magnetization, either NX or NZ, depending on what phase you have over here. Um, and then you have completely removed the magnetization that you started with. That is this hydrogen magnetization that you started with. And now you have this um, particular magnetization in completely the other um, uh, nuclei of interest, okay? Um, so this is the first part, this is your preparation. Uh, let's skip the middle one, we'll come to that. Um, then you have something called a chemical shift uh, labeling uh, period. So during this time, what you do is you actually label uh, the nitrogen dimension because you have this NX or NZ magnetization yeah, you again, so in this case, you have an NZ magnetization. So you apply an X pulse because there's nothing written over here. So this is X. 
Um, so basically when you apply X, so over here, you will get something called as NY, um, okay? Uh, so the moment you have anything that is in like a NX or NY, you can get um, uh, the chemical shift out of it. Um, so you would evolve uh, various uh, uh, chemical shifts in this period. So what happens is you actually increase this value, uh, you decrease this value, and you increase this value. So basically, uh, it is so this particular mechanism is called a semi-constant time. Um, so you probably are running a constant time HSQC. Uh, in constant time HSQC, this whole time period between these, this is actually constant. So you're doing two things: you're evolving chemical shift, and you're transferring this magnetization back to hydrogen. And then you see another inept over here. Again, you create. Um, this, uh, so over here, you're going to create a magnetization that is similar to this, uh, except that this magnetization is labeled with nitrogen in this period. And then you convert that into pure HX or HY magnetization um, over at this point of time. Um, so basically, it depends on um, the, the phases that you select. And then at that point of time, uh, in this experiment, they're using something called as echo. You can skip this. Um, so if you don't do the echo, uh, you would then probably then start doing your acquisition. So acquisition only happens in the XY plane. That is where your receiver is and you acquire your data. And during that, you actually label the hydrogen uh, magnetization over uh, that is your direct dimension. So what does it, what does it mean? So over here, you're labeling your nitrogen. Over here, you're labeling your hydrogen. So this is a 2D experiment, right? So basically, you're now getting correlations between the nitrogen and the hydrogen because they are bonded. That is, there is a covalent bond between this hydrogen and nitrogen. So this is the basis of the HSQC experiment, okay? Um, so let's clear everything, all the mess on the screen. Okay, and then let me remove... Up, um, Okay, so now let's go to our T1 experiment. In our T1 experiment, all that is happening is this, um, this particular time over here, that is this T uh, time. So that is the total time between um, this point and this point. And you're pretty much not doing anything. You're just waiting for this magnetization NZ to exchange between those two states. So you will have Let's say the protein um, that is in state A um, is, uh, let's say 50% populated at this point of time, and then 50% in state B. So during this, uh, uh, this T time, what happens is it actually flips between those two magnetizations, uh, those two states. And uh, during this uh, time period, you will actually see the intensity of these signals would decrease as you increase this time period, okay? Um, so uh, that is what a T1 experiment does. So basically you would, because T1 means longitudinal, you're looking at Z magnetization, you're looking at how this Z magnetization in state A, as well as state B, um, state A and state B, how do they actually exchange between those two different states? And the amount of decrease in signal is directly proportional to the dynamics between those two states. So basically you will run the first experiment with a short time period, that is 0.1 seconds. Then you run a second experiment with 0.2, exper uh, 0.2 seconds, so on and so forth. So this is actually the number of experiments. So basically you're running an HSQC experiment with this extra time period over here, and then you're running them as a function of various times, okay? So that is what T1 experiment does. And um, the, the, the way that we run it is called interleaving. So what does that mean? So basically, um, so the first experiment, you will have this delay, okay? Um, then you will actually label the nitrogen, then you will label the hydrogen, okay? Um, then the second scan, you would do um, this, this time point, um, and then you will label that experiments nitrogen, and then you will label that hydrogen for that time point. Then you do the next scan. So that will be for 0.3 seconds. Uh, and then you will label the nitrogen and hydrogen and so on and so forth. So you will iterate over the number of points that you have here. 
so what does it mean? So you are going to set this as a set, as a third dimension, okay? So this is the first dimension. This is the second dimension. That is the nitrogen. And the third dimension is going to be this guy, okay? Uh, so basically, we are running this as uh, a pseudo 3D experiment because pseudo, because this is not actually a dimension. You're just varying this time as a function of each experiment. So you will do that. And then for the next increment for this value, you will again go here, here, here. You would start this, then you will do this, then you will do this, then you go back. You again do each one of these guys for next increment, and then you acquire the direct dimension. So basically, that is how a T1 experiment uh, is run. Okay. So this is pretty much HSQC with a delay in between. Okay. Um, and another thing that we do apply is something called decoupling. So this decoupling is important because we are going to um, suppress the dipolar, dipolar DD means dipolar, dipolar uh, interaction between hydrogen and nitrogen during this time point, as well as we are suppressing um, N15 chemical shift and acetropy relaxation as well. So basically that is an uh, interference that happens between uh, different nitrogen residues that are close by and we want to suppress that. So that is why we apply this particular decoupling, okay? So um, let me clear all the stuff that's in here. Okay, so this is on the left-hand side is what um, each experiment looks like. So this is an example T1 experiment that was published in biochemistry. This is the first paper where they did this. Um, so this is not the exact pulse program that I showed you, but a similar one. Um, so in that case, they use uh, the top left panel is the time period of 48 milliseconds. So the HSQC with that time period of 48 experiments in between, uh, 48 milliseconds in between the second inept and the chemical shift labeling. And you can see as you're increasing the time, the intensity of each of these peaks, that is the left-hand side of this figure is actually going down. Uh, so what does it mean? So basically, if you look at this particular peak, you can actually see the intensity is going down. and that is what we are interested in. So basically that is what we are running. So as we increase the time, the intensity of the peak reduces. So that is your T1 experiment. Okay, so let me clear this. Let's go to the next screen. Okay, um, so now that um, you run this experiment for the various time points that you have over here, um, so uh, you can actually then uh, get the intensity of the, the zero time point that is just your HSQC, right? Um, then your intensity of um, each peak. So in this case, there are two peaks, one solid and one um, not solid. So there are different regions of the protein. Um, so, but then you can get the intensity of signal for this, let's say solid guy uh, as a function of this time point. So this is this, that is a 0.1 seconds. Uh, this is the 0.2 second time point. That is this guy, okay, uh, for this particular residue. Um, then this corresponds to the 0.3 seconds. This corresponds to 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and 0.6, okay? Um, so basically, these are the intensity of the peak in that HSQC-based uh, uh, T1 experiment. Um, so as you can see, this is an exponential uh, equation. And that is defined as some initial value times e to the power of minus r1 times t. And this t is this, this time point over here. So basically you need to give this as a fitted value. And then this is um, what is actually determined based on this fit, and that is this. So for this residue, it is actually the t1 value is 2.58 plus minus 0.3 um, per second. Okay, um, so we can do the same fit for other peaks in that uh, uh, spectrum that I showed you. So basically you're gonna get each one of this fit for every residue that you have. And then this fit would be slightly different for each residue um, because this residue, this particular, the one that is solid is in probably uh, the middle of a protein. I know for a fact that is in the middle of the protein, so it's very rigid. So this value is going to be a little bigger as compared to a residue that is in um, the extremity that is the, on the C terminus of the protein. In that case, it's going to have much slower relaxation 
Uh, so the relaxation value is going to be smaller. And that would indicate that this particular uh, region in the protein is more dynamic as compared to the one that is uh, that is in the middle of the protein as compared to one that is on the extremity, okay? So basically this is what we are after. We are after these numbers, okay? We are after this T1 value of um, the residues in our protein. So this is how a T1 experiment is run, okay? So next I'm gonna to switch to T2. Do you have any questions? So we can go over um, anything that you have. I can, I can you know, uh, add people to speak uh, if you're interested in asking questions verbally, or you can send me a question on Q&A or chat and uh, we can talk over it. If not, we will move on to the next one. Um, okay. So let's move on. So this is how you would actually uh, run this. So let me clear all my drawings from this. Okay. Um, okay, so let's go to the T2 experiment. So you see, once I block the T2 region in here, it looks exactly same as an HSQC experiment that I showed you, right? Um, except that uh, there are slight differences. So let me point out the differences. So over here, you see there is no 90 degree pulse because we are interested in the NX magnetization. We do, in our T1 experiments, we were interested in NZ magnetization. That is what we were interested in. But in this case, for the T2 experiment, we are interested in an X magnetization. Everything else is the same. So you are actually starting from H magnetization and you end up with the N magnetization or I, you're going to S and you're ending up with something called NX or NY magnetization, depending on what phases you select, okay? Um, so basically, um, once you are in this, um, then you can actually, um, uh, label your nitrogen in this uh, region. So that is your chemical shift labeling region. And then you refocus and put the magnetization back on hydrogen and then you do your acquisition, okay? So the overall, this is pretty much the same. Only thing that is different is, is missing this, this Y and it's also missing the X that actually puts this back into so that you can actually measure your chemical shift. So that is the only difference between this experiment and um, the 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 you know the T two um, uh, the T one experiment. Okay, so let me clear this and let's go back. Okay, um, so now let's uh, see what is happening in our um, the T period. Okay, so in the T period, uh, so the, that is the the time that you vary as a function of uh, this experiment. So over here you're actually measuring the nitrogen chemical shift. Over here you're measuring the hydrogen chemical shift. So this is dimension number one, uh, this is dimension number two, and this is your third dimension, okay? Uh, and here you see there are different time points um, that you're varying. And as you're actually uh, varying this time point, you are actually changing this time over here. So this is again collected as a pseudo 3D experiment. Um, and then I usually recommend people to like, you know, uh, create a random, distribution of these numbers over here. You don't want a linear um, distribution, um, but then we are also running this interleave. That is, you're gonna see the first scan in this dimension uh, with the direct dimension over here. You're going to run the time period of 30 milliseconds. Then the second scan you will run 60 milliseconds, the third scan 90 milliseconds and 120 and so on and so forth. So it will depend on how many points you're collecting, but yeah, so you're pretty much running HSQC experiments, um, and uh, basically you are varying this time over here, and then um, you have something over here. So these are 180 degree pulses where you're decoupling um, the nitrogen that is in connection with the hydrogen that is over there. And also you apply this 180 degree pulse and it is kind of looks asymmetric. So you're only applying this every other, you know, so you would, you would see that most NMR experiments are symmetric, right? Uh, so if you just look at this section, see it's symmetric. Look at this section, symmetric. Look at this, this is kind of symmetric. This is semi constant time. This is symmetric, this is symmetric, this is symmetric, right? But this is not. So basically this is intentional. This particular 180 degree pulse is to actually apply every other 
time period over here. And that is very, very important for actually reducing your chemical stress and anisotropy effects um, based on um, the, the T2 uh, relaxation of the various regions of the protein. Okay, so that, those are the small differences as you notice this, uh, but that is very, very important for getting good data. Okay, um, so in this T2 experiment, uh, we have covered what encompasses this. And then you would see that the T2 values that we use are much, much, much smaller uh, as compared to the T1 values, um, because this is the range at which we actually see the T2 relaxation. Okay, um, so this is the right-hand side of the data that you see. That is um, here T equal to 5.36 milliseconds, T equal to 48 milliseconds, 118 milliseconds. Then you would see that the intensity of the peak uh, looks um, highest at the lowest uh, time period that you have, that is T equal to 5.36 uh, uh, milliseconds. And that particular intensity is much smaller for a higher uh, relaxation time. So basically then you would take the intensity of this particular peak at various time points, and then you will plot it just like you plotted your T1 value, okay? Um, and then once you plot it, you will get um, the T2 relaxation of the things that you're interested in. So the, the equation is also very, very similar. So you have some constant, this is your initial magnetization. So whatever that is, the, is over here, that is your initial magnetization, e to the power of minus R2, Minus is because it's actually decreasing as a function of time. And this time is this time point over here. So that is that is what you actually fit and you actually get your T2 uh, or R2 value. Anytime I say T2 is one over R2, okay? Um, so you actually get this T, uh, R2 value and that is what is plotted over here. Um, so this is 5.96 plus minus 0 0.07 and 2.97 uh, plus minus 0 0.8. Again, this is for the exactly same residue. So this uh, particular residue um, is um, in the middle of the protein, in the core of the protein. So it's a little rigid. So it'll have a higher value. The ones that are in the, um, the end terminus of this protein is going to be much smaller value. So once you compare these two, you will get some idea of what are the different motions that are happening for the different regions of um, the protein that you're interested in. And um, another thing that you will notice, you see there are like two points over here. There are like two points over here. It's always good to uh, like repeat. So what I mean by that is probably we also add another, let's say 150 milliseconds. So we can add, you know, repeats. So this way uh, that can be used for something called error estimation. So you can estimate the error in the fit based on the values that you're actually seeing. So these are, you see, um, these are 180 degree pulses and uh, you apply a whole bunch of them, okay? N is, um, so each section in, uh, in a T2 experiment is actually 16 milliseconds, okay? Uh, so, you, so this whole block is 16 milliseconds. So, you, so this particular is a, uh, experiment is actually two blocks. This is actually four blocks. This is, so it's like a multiple of the 16 millisecond blocks. And 16 milliseconds are a very, very long time. Um, so basically what it means is you're applying a whole bunch of these pulses um, and those are radio frequency pulses and they can like heat up your sample. So be very, very careful. Just don't go crazy with this number. Uh, uh, so basically uh, this is something called as a CPMG and uh, CPMG um, or um, experiments, you are applying a whole bunch of 180 degree pulses and very, very uh, easy to actually apply a lot of these and heat up your sample. You'll probably cook your sample. So you have to be very careful. So once you run this T2 experiment, make sure you just don't go overboard by uh, this higher number that you have over there. And then every once in a while, when you're collecting the data, come back, look at what the status of this experiment is. Okay, and uh, just because of this, you will create a lot of sample heating, make sure that the spectrometer doesn't get damaged as well. So if you have very big number, a lot of heating going on, you can damage your spectrometer as well. So um, this is a very dangerous experiment to run, but then, you know, um, you probably damage your protein before you damage the spectrometer. So 
yeah, we want you to get good data out of your samples that you uh, have uh, generated. Um, so be very, very careful. Just don't use crazy values over here um, and ask me for help when you set these experiments. Okay, um, so basically um, this is how uh, uh, you can interpret the data. Uh, you can look at these uh, T2 values and you can actually get some idea of what are the different motions that are happening in uh, the protein of interest. Okay. So next is the NOE. Okay, uh, we'll talk about that before we, uh, before that. If anyone has any questions about T2 experiments, let me know. We will, because we are going to skip to the NOE portion. So if you have any questions, raise your hand or send a, send a chat or Q&A, or I can give you an opportunity to talk and it's up to you. I don't see anything. Okay. Uh, feel free to stop me at any time. Send that message if you have any questions. Okay. Um, so let's go to the last uh, portion. So this is the NOE um, relaxation experiment. This is not the nosy experiment that you usually run. The nosy is your hydrogen, hydrogen nosy. So in this case, what you're actually doing is so again, every experiment has these sections, right? So in this case, you have, uh, let me go to annotate. Okay. Um, so you have your preparation period, you have chemical shift period, you have your refocus, then you have acquisition. So in the chem so basically you prepare, so you start from NZ magnetization, you apply this X pulse, so you will get something called NY. And uh, from once you have NY, you can actually label it. So you'll still have NY at the end of this. And then um, from here, then you actually, um, it, it'll, it'll be NY along with your chemical shift label for nitrogen, okay? Um, and then over here, you transfer the magnetization to something in H and then you acquire. So basically now you will get chemical shift labeling in this particular dimension. So basically this experiment, um, only difference that you would do are um, actually either you turn on the saturation at the beginning of experiments or you turn it off, okay? Uh, so. Um, in this case, you would still have the same amount of time, but this is not turned on. Uh, and um, so we call this NOE on and NOE off. So NOE on means you are actually turning on the saturation and NOE off is you're turning off the saturation. So basically you're running this in interleaved manner as well, but it's only two different experiments, okay? Um, so basically one is on, one is off. So um, the problem, any anyone sees a problem over here or like, you know, it's not a problem, but again, uh, it is an issue with the intensity of the signal, right? So let me clear this, let's get out. Let's go back to the T2 experiment. You see, in our T2 experiment, you are actually starting from the hydrogen magnetization. You're going to the nitrogen, doing your T2 experiments, labeling your nitrogen, going back to hydrogen, okay? So that is what you're doing in your um, NMR experiment. But in your um, NOE experiment, you are starting directly from the nitrogen magnetization. And uh, basically before this magnetization, you are applying uh, this whole uh, bunch of 180 degree pulse that is called pre-saturation. And uh, you are not starting from the hydrogen magnetization. So that is very, very important. So because you are starting from the nitrogen magnetization, you're going to have um, much lower intensity of the signal. So that is why I recommend people to run this as like a 12 hour with a lot of scans. So you can compensate the reduction in the intensity by increasing uh, the number of scans, okay? So if you increase the number of scans, uh, you can actually get much higher signal over noise. So once you run this as a 12 hour or one day experiment, you will get enough signal because you started from NZ magnetization because you're seeing the effect of the hydrogen that are close by as, as on this NZ. And then you are actually um, doing the chemical shift over here. And this is still a 2D. So you're measuring the nitrogen in this region, hydrogen in this region. And then you're actually running this over a long period of time. The previous uh, experiment, the T1 and the T2 experiment, you started on the hydrogen magnetization. So you, because of the higher gyromagnetic ratio of hydrogen, your signal to noise is going to be much, much, much higher as compared to this experiment. So that is why you run this as, you know, um, as 
NOE on and NOE off with much, much, much higher scans. And this is usually uh, one day. Uh, so if you run two experiments that is NOE on and NOE off, um, so that's like 12 hours plus 12 hours is, is pretty much one day. Um, the T1, T2 NOE are pretty much um, four hours to like eight hours each, depending on how many scans you have on your concentration of protein that you have. And then you collect that as a function of number of points. Usually I recommend people to run somewhere between 12 points to 16 points. Again, the selection of points is also very, very important. Um, so if you have a very small range, you may not be able to fit the data. Okay. Um, but yeah, so that is what you do in these experiments. So the T1 takes three days, T2 takes three days, NOE experiment takes a day. So this is why it's like a one week, right? So three plus three plus one is seven. And um, that is why we are giving everyone who's attending this um, webinar um, and access to seven days of NMR spectrometer time to collect this particular experiments on anything that you have in your lab that you are interested in. Okay, um, so this is called NOE enhancement. So basically, um, so let me turn on, on annotations. So with NOE on, you're going to have um, uh, some peak. So this is that particular peak and the same peak shows up as a positive uh, once you turn off the saturation. So once you turn that saturation off, um, you will get this, then you get the intensity and you get the ratio and that is this ratio that is the saturation that is this guy over here and not saturated over here. So you get that intensity and then you get something called this NOE enhancement for this particular um, uh, residue of interest. Uh, you're getting much higher NOE enhancement uh, in the negative value. So basically this means that this is very, very dynamic. Um, and then um, this is that the same uh, data that I showed you, that is that uh, solid peaks uh, for uh, the T1 and T2. This is in the n terminus region of the protein. So that is why you're going to get much higher enhancement once you run this particular experiment, when you turn on the saturation period over here. And um, this is uh, very, very uh, useful. And then this is only two experiments. Uh, you don't run it um, for various time periods. This is a fixed time period just turn on or off, that's it. This is a very simple experiment. Um, okay, um, I like NOE experiments because they are so simple. Uh, okay, so this is the overall plot of every residue for this particular protein of interest. So you see that, uh, so anything that is, so on the top of these figures, you see the arrows. Um, so they are um, actually um, your alpha helices. Um, these are your beta sheets. And anything that doesn't have any of these arrows or uh, boxes, um, those are the loop regions or N terminus or C terminus. Uh, so basically, um, this is what is shown over here. Um, so the R1 value for everything that I showed um, are the T1 uh, relaxation or the R1 values are actually plotted um, and as a function of residue. Um, so what does it mean? So it means that you probably also need um, the assignment, okay? So in order to actually get information of which region of the protein is giving rise to the, these various R1 values, you would also require assignments. So that will be the topic for our next NMR workshop. Um, so I'll keep an eye out on, on that particular email that I'll send you. So we will go over a tutorial of how to do the assignments um, and yeah, we'll, uh, we'll do the tutorial on how to do the assignment, and then um, we will try to figure out um, how <clears throat> we can actually uh, get uh, which signals in our HSQC correspond to which region of our protein, right? Um, based on the chemical shifts, and we'll go over these different strategies. But again, this, someone has already done it. They actually know which region of the protein corresponds to which. Uh, region of uh, uh, the, the spectra that you collect. And then they have calculated these R1 values. That is, they have fitted that as a function of the exponential curve that I showed you. And that is each and every uh, one of these values over here. Uh, same thing for R2. What is happening? Sorry about that. Okay, so basically um, for the T2, the exactly same thing 
happens. So you plot R2 um, for each and every residue. That is each point is actually um, that exponential curve that I uh, showed you for that particular residue. So you do that fit for every one of these residues. They're pretty much same for the well, you know, folded regions of the protein. Uh, you see that this region is a little bit flexible and that is your beginning of the alpha helix and that is the end of the loop. So that is kind of very dynamic. And then you will see that this particular region is also very dynamic. Same thing for NOE relaxations. It's just that enhancement, that NOE enhancement that I showed you, pretty much constant. And then this region of the protein is uh, very dynamic and that is evident from the NOE enhancement. There's some NOE enhancement for the loop regions as well. Uh, some loop regions over here, some loop regions over here, and some part of the alpha helix as well. Um, so that is very interesting. So basically, this is uh, why you would run these experiments. And this is your end goal, right? So the, once you get these, you can get some overall idea about what is happening with your protein. Um, and uh, you can get some kind of information on how dynamic these regions are for various parts of your protein. So, so that is how uh, we would um, analyze the data. So now we will switch over and try to do a setup of these experiments on the spectrometer. So again, I'll go over the various ways of doing it. So we will do two different ways. Uh, the first one is actually we'll go over the manual uh, that Topspin provides and we'll do a manual setup. Um, and then we will also use something called Biotop. And this makes your life much, much, much easier once you start using Biotop. Okay, um, so let's do that. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask in chat. So let's set up these experiments. Let's um, go through the different processes for setting up these experiments. Okay. So let me share my other screen. Um, So this is uh, the 600 megahertz uh, spectrometer that is in 1047. Um, so this is a Bruker Neo console. Um, so it, 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 it's a, it has, uh, okay. So it has uh, the, the cryoprobe. Uh, so basically, before you start your experiments, make sure that uh, the sample temperature is set correctly. So you can just double click on the experiment, uh, the, the temperature over here and set the temperature to the temperature that you're interested in. Um, and then um, you can set the power level to maximum if you want to go any temperature below 10 degrees Celsius um, and then set it back to medium once you're done with your experiment. Um, so this is, um, this is a very slow process. So the moment you change anything other than 25 degrees, please wait uh, at least 15 minutes uh, for your sample to equilibrate. So basically, uh, let's say you want to run an experiment at 15 degrees. So before you start your experiments, change your temperature and wait 15 minutes after your samples inside the magnet. Okay. Um, so this kind of like make sure that it's kind of like equilibrated at that temperature before you start your experiment. And uh, this is the Topspin 4.09. We're going to update this to a higher version pretty soon once it releases 4.14. Um, but in this particular version, um, there are uh, um, different capabilities uh, that uh, are more enhanced in the newer version. Okay, so in the top uh, right corner, right next to the Bruker um, icon, you would see that there is this question mark. So you can click on manuals uh, and, or I would suggest go to this thing called NMR guide, okay? So this is like very, very useful uh, for getting information on various experiments that you want to run on your NMR spectrometer. Um, so this is how you get to it. That is you go on that question mark. So then you can click on tutorials. Um, so then you can click on NMR, uh, protein NMR. And then you on the top, uh, corner you have see it says T1, T2, NOE for F3, and then gives you a whole list of different experiments that you can run, okay? Um, so for NOE experiment, you can run two different experiments. So you can run an HSQC based, 
or the Retrosi based, okay? So that is your HSQC and that is your Trozy. Uh, in order to measure your T1 relaxation, there are like so many different um, versions of it. So basically, this is the one that we are going to run, okay? So that is this HSQC T1 pseudo 3D. So again, they have very good description of what this is. Uh, so you can click on this and it can tell you what this experiment is. This is pretty much what I showed you, right? Um, so basically you are actually um, changing that D7 and that is your uh, relaxation time and uh, you are measuring chemical shift, you're uh, transferring magnetization and all that, okay? So basically it tells you which parameter set that you need to use. So this is the one. Um, so you can copy this or you can remember what it says over there. Um, but yeah, so that is how you choose an experiment. You can choose any one of these experiments. You can run a Trozy version of this uh, as a pseudo 3D. Um, and then for T2 relaxation, you can run again, any one of these versions, but we're gonna run this particular experiment. So basically um, you have um, this region that you vary and this particular uh, loop counter is 16 milliseconds, like I told you, and you just change the number of these blocks that you add as a function of uh, various time points. So if you have two blocks, it's two times 16. So that's around 32 milliseconds and so on and so forth. Um, so we are not uh, running the T1 row experiment or the cross relaxation experiment, but yeah. So this is how you would get to the manual and try to find the correct, um, you know, the pulse program, okay? So even if I'm not around or mainly it's not around, you're trying to, uh, study up on, hey, the, how do I get my T1 values? Or which experiment to choose? This is the catalog of everything, okay? So this is how you get to it, and then you can run this. Again, this is not the only way that you can collect T1, T2. So you can also collect uh, um, based on an HNCO experiment. So basically you run a 3D HNCO, and this is a different paper. But yeah, you can use this particular pulse program. Uh, there's no parameter set, but yeah, you can, you can run these, uh, experiments to get your T1, T2, and OE. So this is not the only way that you can uh, get those values. Okay, so le now let's go back. Let's click on, um, let's say this guy. Okay, so this is a T1. So, so basically it tells you, um, this is what is the parameter set. Um, so we will try to uh, get, uh, <clears throat> uh, load this parameter set in our NMR experiment. Okay, um, so, So now that we know which experiment to run, um, let me EDC, EDC, or you can type in new. Again, it's up to you, or you can click on create data set, exactly same thing. They do exactly same things. Um, so let's go create an experiment over here. And here you have this option, read parameter set, right? So I have like already copied this parameter set from the manual that I showed you, right? So. This is that parameter set it told me to run. Um, so basically you bring it over here, set your solvent, do uh, get prosol, um, and you can just say, okay. So now it's gonna create experiment number 100. Um, so there are few dimensions over here, and then you have this particular uh, dimension. Okay, so let's go over what this is. So F3 dimension, that is over this guy is your hydrogen dimension. So you set your sweep width depending on the HSQC sweep width um, of hydrogen. Uh, this is the number of points in the nitrogen dimension. And you set the sweep width for the nitrogen uh, for the H from the HSQC that you have collected. In my case, I have an HSQC for this particular experiment. Um, so basically, I have a trozy, so yeah. So basically I just pick these values, that is these um, sweep width from an HSQC or a trozy. In trozy, it will be slightly shifted. So you want to make sure that uh, it is, it is um, an HSQC based experiment to get a good uh, idea about what these numbers should be. And then this is that time period that you are, that is the number of points that you are varying for that T1 period. Um, so let me first show you the file that it reads. So here on this left-hand side, there is this thing called list, or you can like scroll down from the top. So this is all the way up here. 
So if you scroll down, you'll end up with list or this is much quicker. So it reads something called VB list. So you click on this. Um, so there are like two points over here, but yeah, you can create a whole variety of um, uh, uh, list of values. And this is how many points that it has. So the first relaxation value is 20 milliseconds. The second relaxation value is 1,200 milliseconds or 1 1.2 seconds, okay? So in this case, there are only two points, which means that uh, if I were to run this experiment, this number needs to match the number of points I have. So this should be two, okay? Um, so this is the only criteria of how you manually set it up. And um, we'll do the byte of one later, but yeah, this is how you would set this up. So let's say you are not happy with this, um, uh, you know, numbers that are in this BD list, go ahead and create a new one, okay? Um, so if you click on this, um, you can actually see various users have created their own VD list, right? Um, so let's say um, this is like example, right? So you can go edit and you see there are like various so uh, points over here, which means in this case, if you were to use this particular file, it'll have 14 points. So your QF in the third dimension needs to, needs to be 14, okay? Um, so this is uh, another uh, T1 delay. So basically you can, uh, so instead of milliseconds, you can use seconds as well. So of course for, <clears throat> for seconds, um, you don't have to use um, the M um, character at the end. So if you don't give anything, it will take the values a second. So this is going to be point, um, this is going to be one millisecond, right? And this is uh, 5,000 uh, milliseconds stuff like that. So the, because the unit of this is seconds, but yeah. So this particular user had this particular uh, set of values that they used for their T1 uh, relaxation uh, for their experiment. And in this case, because if, let's say if you choose this experiment, uh, this, uh, this file, you have to change the QF value to be 10. Okay, so again, if you don't uh, like the values that is in here, you can go and create a new one or you can go and edit this file and say file save as, and then just give it your own name that you are interested in. And then you can load that um, VD list. Only thing that you need to make sure if there are two values over here or there are 10 values over here, whatever that number is, that number needs to match this number over here. So as long as you do that, now you can do everything that you have done for your HSQC based experiments. You lock your sample, you tune, you shim, you, uh, you can do get prosol or you can do pulse cal and you do RG and ZG. So that is, you know, that is your basic training that you uh, get when you set up your HSQC experiment, you just follow through that. But before that, this is how you set up your T1 experiment, okay? So that is how you manually set it up, okay? Um, so now let's go back, let's look at the T2 experiment. So T2 experiment, um, so this is what I run. Um, so this is a HSQC based pseudo 3D experiment. Um, this is the, the parameter set. So you can copy this, actually I clicked the wrong thing. So you can actually go T2, click on here and it says, please use this parameter set, right? So it's the same thing, uh, but yeah, you would copy this. Uh, now let's go back top spin or let me minimize this thing. Okay, so let's EDC. EDC. So over here, read parameter set, you would then paste this. So HSQC base T2 uh, experiment, F3 means it's a nitrogen experiment with uh, pseudo 3D. Um, so now it's going to automatically increment the value to 101. So that's the next available experiment. So it creates that. Again, the idea is the same. This dimension is your hydrogen dimension. This dimension is your nitrogen dimension. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, and then you would create, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the next dimension is going to be the number of points. Okay, I see there is a, a question. Uh, how do you determine or decide on time that is optimum? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, so basically um, for any T1 experiment, T2 experiments, you probably um, have to collect the data first and see what happens. So basically what I mean by that is um, if the relaxation is much slower or much faster, 
you will easily see that nothing happens to the intensity of the signal or something drastically happens. That is the first point, it'll be at 100%. The next point, it'll be zero, or it could be like 10% of what you started with. So that means your relaxation points that you chose is not correct, uh, or they were like too far apart or too short. Um, so you want to then increase or decrease uh, this, this particular time. So yeah, you, you probably have to uh, keep changing these values. That is why uh, this particular user, um, so let me show you, um, there are like so many different, you know, um, values that you use to actually screen for these uh, values. Um, so uh, you can actually change uh, the number of points. Um, you can create a wide variety of them. Uh, I have a good estimate of which uh, points that you want to use, and that can be um, uh, a good estimate of the starting points. But once you're finished with that, you can then um, uh, optimize it. So basically, let's say you had points that are kind of very uh, like, you know, spread apart. Then once you run it, you see that the, uh, the first experiment and sec second experiment have very different values. That is the, the drastic uh, relaxation. So then you would stop that experiment and recollect that experiment with points that are less um, far apart. And that is how you would actually get a good um, set of values for you. That is why I'm emphasizing create your own data set. Don't use the you know example uh, and seem like you know this particular so there are like two points over here. So someone is testing this, and again you know everyone uses this. So please don't use this data set. Um, go and create your own file. Again, there's just a text file with numbers in it. it takes less than two minutes to create this text file. And um, this is stored at this particular path that is shown over here. And that is how you would choose a good set of values. Um, again, this is for T2. Uh, so basically for T2, uh, you would again create in this case, 16 points. Uh, you see there are a lot of repeats. So there's like six is repeated uh, two times. Um, and I'm guessing 16 is also repeated uh, two times and then uh, two is repeated two times. So basically this is used for your error estimation. And then this is a good spread of different uh, sections. So each one of this section that is a loop counter of one for a T2 experiment corresponds to 16 milliseconds. So two corresponds to 32 milliseconds, four is going to be 64 and so on and so forth. So basically the more number you have, the higher T2 you have and they are a function of number of blocks. In T1 experiment, you specify the delay directly. In your T2 experiment, you'd specify uh, each one of these points, okay? Um, so or you specify the number of blocks that you want, okay? So let's say you selected this experiment, you say, you know, set this item. So now it says, okay. So basically there are 16 points in this, right? So let's verify that. So there are 16 points. So if you were to run this particular experiment, you would set um, this, and then you would change this to 16, and then go over locking, tuning, shimming, um, get prosol, RGA, and ZG, same thing that you usually do, obviously, uh, adjust your sweep width, adjust your number of scans, and everything is going to affect your experiment time. So, so let's say for 16 points, I have 16 scans uh, for this particular experiment. So this, let's, if I do the experiment time, uh, it takes a while, but yeah, so there you go. So nine, uh, nine hours for this particular experiment. So which means that um, I can go much higher number of points in the nitrogen dimension. Uh, let's do 64. Let's see what this time period is. Um, so it takes a while for this particular calculation. Sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow. Um, Okay, there you go. So two days, 23 hours. So this is what pretty much what I would recommend. So this is around three days, right? So pretty much three days, 23 hours, 59 minutes, approximately 24 hours. So yeah, um, so this is, this is a good way to actually set this up. Um, so the other thing uh, that I would uh, recommend um, is actually be wary of this D1 period. Uh, you don't want to use very small D1 uh, time for your T1 and T2 experiment. This should be at least four or five times your T2 relaxation of your project. Um, so use a bigger number, um, the higher field that you run. 
for 600 megahertz, one second is good enough for most proteins. If you have a bigger protein, you want to use a bigger number over here. Um, and if you are running on 800 megahertz, you want to use a bigger number over there, okay? Um, so again, for NOE experiment, let's go back um, over here. So now it tells you, this is that experiment that you need to run. Um, so this is the parameter set. Um, again, it's actually very, very simple. From now, you can just do EDC, read parameter set, okay? So I'm showing you these steps because let's say you want to run this uh, somewhere else where they don't have this biotop. In that case, this is how you set this up. So that way, you know, you're covered. You know how to set this up. Okay, that is why I'm going over how to manually do this. Okay. Um, yeah, so I see there's in the question 16 to 10. Okay, um, so basically, so this would mean 16 times 16, 256 million. Yeah, that's a very long time, yeah. Um, so is it acceptable? Probably, but um, um, in that case, they were uh, had a different sample and they were running a different T2 experiment. Um, so yeah, so, you know, the, the, it was, yeah. So basically talk to me if you want to use something like this. So I think you can use up to 20, um, loop count or 20 on the modern cryo probes. So as long as, you know, uh, so the, the thing about the modern cryo probes is you have to try it until you break it uh, as compared to what you were told before. Um, so the newer ones have a slightly um, higher uh, tolerances with the VT controller and uh, it has a slightly different heating uh, um, components happening when you are applying this radio frequency pulse, the shieldings are much better. Um, so yeah, it depends. So on the newer cryo probes, yeah, you can go up to 20 uh, for T2, um, the number of loop count is 20. And uh, the, uh, the file that I showed you, that was a different, um, different file. Um, okay, uh, so basically for the N uh, HSQC NOZI, uh, HSQC based NOE experiment uh, for getting our relaxation, Again, there are only two dimensions over here. So you run one with a particular value. So now in this case, you go to pulse prog and it'll actually tell you what to do. So basically um, you would run this experiment. So this is run in an interleaved manner. And then you would actually type this command um, over here. So once this is done, you can just say split space two uh, because it tells you there. And the first experiment that you see is going to be the NOE on. And the second experiment that you see is NOE off. There is no NOE, okay? So that is how you set this up. Again, this is very, very simple. Um, the only thing that you need to be um, careful about in this experiment is this is actually the number of points that is number of points in NOE plus the number of points in no NOE. So if you want to get the same resolution as here, so the, here in this case, uh, let's say you had 256 points with 64 scans, right? Um, so basically, if you want to uh, run this particular experiment, um, so basically, in order to get 256 points for both NOE and not NOE, um, where is my one or two? Okay, so this number should be two times of that, so phi 12. So when you do the split space two, it actually splits this number by two. So in order to get the same amount of resolution as other experiments, you want to make sure that this number is two times of what you wanted. So that way split space two is going to give you the correct number. But other than that, this is the sweep width for each one of these dimensions. And then uh, you can run this experiment by changing the number of scans. Usually I recommend you run this experiment as a function of two days or one day. Okay, this is way too much. So just 64 scans, um, around 20, 23 hours. Okay, so this is a good, uh, you know, this is how you adjust it based on the parameter set that you have. Okay, the other thing that you want to be careful about for nosy experiment is this number may not be sufficient. So you probably want to use like two seconds or something. Um, so you want to be very, very careful that this number is high enough 
so that you are actually um, having a good recovery of the magnetization back to equilibrium before you start your, um, your pre-saturation. So uh, for the nosy experiment, make sure that this number is a, a bigger number um, to be guaranteed that you start with the Z magnetization at the beginning of your experiment, okay? Um, Okay, so this is how you manually set this up, okay? So this is how, you know, people uh, set it up before the automation was, <laughs> was a thing, okay? Okay, now let me show you how to easily do it using Biotop, okay? Um, so the various way of um, doing um, this experiment, uh, these experiments in Biotop. Um, so you can go uh, to acquire section. So if you are in a different section, you can go to the acquire one, uh, go to more and you can click on this or you can type in by the top, uh, it's up to you. <coughs> okay, so because I have run by top on this particular um, sample, so all the parameters have loaded for me, but if it didn't load for you, make sure that you go and edit these values. So put some name for your sample, um, give a description, what kind of sample is it? Is the protein? Um, then you can specify the molecular weight and what it is labeled with. In this case, it was C13 and 15 uh, sample. So one thing I forgot to tell everyone is that, hey, because this is a N15 based experiment, you need not have it double labeled. You don't require labeling the carbon. Uh, if you do, do specify that it is labeled with carbon so that you decouple the carbon. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but other than that, um, you can just label it by N15 and run these experiments. So it's not that uh, expensive sample that you prepare. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is probably more expense is in terms of the NMR time, which we're gonna give one week of NMR time for everyone who attends this. But yeah, the, the, that, is, um, that is what you set up. So if it's just N15, you'll set up N15. If it is both C13 and N15, you will decouple the carbon. Uh, during your chemical shift uh, um, uh, labeling section of your pulse program. Uh, select your solvent, uh, so H2O, or D2O. Or usually biomolecules are water-based uh, solvents and the different uh, tubes. So if you're using a shigemi tube, you can use a shigemi tube. In this case, this is a five millimeter tube. Um, you can set the temperature here directly. Um, then what you do is say set, you can do a locking over here, you can do matching and you can do a shim. So if you had a different tube, it will automatically shim to that particular tube, okay? So I have already done it. So that's why I'm not going to select this. And then once you do that, you can go to the optimization section. And then you would probably need to optimize the 90 degree pulse. This is pretty much running pulse cal for you uh, for the hydrogen dimension. And then you can um, <clears throat> create the same kind of optimization for nitrogen. It is not required, but yeah, if it does it, why, why not take advantage of that? Um, so it's very similar to what you actually use the default values. Um, it's probably different than like the third decimal or something like that. And also you can optimize the sweep width, but I would have a very specific control. Uh, so I would go in and put in the correct center frequency for the nitrogen dimension and the sweep width that I'm interested in. Um, so this is what I would do. So if I were to optimize it, I would just optimize the 90 degree hydrogen, the 90 degree nitrogen, and then set the correct sweep width. Um, and then I can, I can, I'll just click on start optimization, okay? So before you click start optimization, make sure that your sample is inside the magnet, okay? Um, so once you do that, you can do this. So um, if you have these guys selected, so it's going to first go and uh, change the temperature, then lock, then tune, then shim, and then it'll do the optimization. It'll optimize your hydrogen um, 90 degrees and it's going to optimize your nitrogen 90. We don't care about carbon. It's just a decoupling pulse. So you don't have to optimize the carbon for this particular case. Um, and then uh, you can click on, so these are the experiments that I have already set up. So that's why it shows up here. But in your case, this will be empty on the uh, right-hand side. Uh, so you click on protein, um, then you can click on um, relaxation. Uh, then you have your T1 relaxation. So you can click on that and then you can click on add. So now it'll create a pulse, uh, you know, it'll create a new experiment over here. 
and you can right click and click on edit. So this is the number of points in your hydrogen dimension, number of points in your uh, nitrogen dimension. So we can use 256 points. That's a good number. And then this is that Q3, that is the number of points that you have. Um, so you can either go and edit this file uh, or you can select a different file. Um, so if you were to use this particular exp uh, what do I do? Okay. So if I were to use this particular um, file, 20 and 1,200 uh, milliseconds, uh, then this number should be two. Okay. Um, so you can set that. Uh, this is your relaxation time. So make sure that it's around one second for 600 megahertz for somewhere around less than 20 um, kilodalton protein. Um, you can use uh, the dummy scan numbers here and number of scans. So in this case, I can just do a 64 scan. Um, so over here, and you can click on experiment time. So now it will set these values and then say, hey, this takes 16 hours to run it, okay? Uh, but yeah, so this is how you set it up and you can then say save. So now experiment number 18 has been created for, um, you know, running those, those points that you selected. For T2, see, it's so quick, right? So that is how you set it up. And it uses these optimized values that you have already done the optimization. So the um, optimization takes around uh, maybe 10 minutes. So you want to wait till the optimization is complete. And once optimization complete, this window becomes active and then you can set up these experiments. Okay, so let's go and add the T2 experiment. Let's go and add the heteronuclear NOE uh, experiment as well. So experiment number 18 is T1, 19 is T2. This is heteronuclear NOE. So again, let's go and edit the T2 experiment. This is your third dimension. This is your uh, nitrogen dimension, 256, 64. Again, you can select the correct number of points. In this case, I think this is just two points. So you can set two points. So um, now you can do your experiment time. You can get an estimate of how much time these two experiments take and you can do save. Um, so let's do the same thing for uh, nosy. Um, so you go over here, set the number of points. So 512 is a good number. So this is two times of 256 that you were interested in. And this is this two dimensions. Um, see the relaxation delay they recommend is 2.5 uh, milliseconds. So you want to be much, much, much higher than your T1 and T2 experiments, okay? So make sure that this D1 number is much higher. Um, so then you can set your dummy scans, your number of scans, uh, so 64 scans. And let's see how much time this takes, uh, two days. So yeah, so then probably, in order to get good, let's do 32 scans. So that's around one day. Okay. So this is how you set it up. You then um, never use NUS uh, for T1, T2, NOE. Uh, NUS stands for non uniform sampling. Um, just skip it. Um, yeah, it'll be really troublesome uh, when you're trying to fit intensities. NUS uh, does something called as, you know, iteratively looks for peaks and tries to enhance the peak. Yeah, you don't want any intensity enhancement when you're doing these calculations. So um, yeah, you want exact effect of that T2 that you can actually uh, collect um, based on these experiments. Um, there are a few papers that I have seen recently where they have implemented NUS based on T1, T2, and OE. Uh, again, um, just proceed with caution, read that paper. What are the things that make that um, approach uh, correct? and what can make your approach wrong. So you can actually see that paper and figure out uh, if that is the route you want to go. But yeah, so this is how you set up your T1, T2, and OE based on, um, uh, based on Biotop, and then you click on run experiments, that's it. So now this will run these experiments for you. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to remove these guys because I have already run the T1, T2, and NOE for you. Okay, uh, but yeah, um, this is how you set it up. Once you click on run experiments, uh, anything that is in the queue will go up and it'll run that for you. Okay, um, so don't close this window while it is running, wait till it finishes and then you can close this window. Um, and uh, the beauty of this is you can also get an optimization report as well. So you can click on report and it'll give you a PDF of uh, 
what the optimization looked like. And you can keep it in your notebook as well. Say that, hey, I have optimized this before I started my experiment. And uh, yeah, so basically, excuse me. Where did the report go? It's somewhere, some window. Okay, it's right here. Yeah, so it told me that, hey, my hydrogen was this much, my nitrogen was this much and all that. So you can, uh, you can then put this um, in your notebook and say that what is the status and you have uh, run these experiments and stuff like that. This is very useful. Um, and then it's good for bookkeeping as well for you. Um, so yeah, that's how you use Biotop to run these experiments. Um, and uh, so the next thing, So before we go to the next section, which is processing T1, T2, NOE data. So does anyone have questions about how to collect data? Um, <coughs> yeah, so yeah, so basically I showed you two ways to collect this data, uh, how to manually set it up, how to set it up using Biotop. Um, if um, you have the ability to have access to top spin four and above, use a Biotop, it makes your life much easier, very good for bookkeeping, and it creates these reports. So you can save those reports and then you can um, refer back to what your different pulses were and what experiments you ran. And uh, it, it's very, very um, user-friendly um, and makes your life easier, less time for you to set up. So yeah, use that. Um, so in the next section, we're going to, um, so hopefully, so these questions are done, right? Okay, so, okay. So if you have any questions, let me know. If not, let's, go to the next section. This is processing this data. Now that you have collected this data, what does it mean? How do we get um, the relaxation values and uh, how do we process it? So there, I will again show you two different ways of processing it. Um, okay, um, so basically um, for your T1 experiment, you have your initial magnetization that is decaying as a function of time and you're fitting for this R1 value. So basically, if you plot T as a function of this particular guy over here, so you will see uh, a constant relaxation happening and you will have various points um, that you're actually fitting your, your values for. And basically this uh, rate of R1 is your fitted parameter. So you do the same thing for R2 as well. You collect that particular data set and the data set looks very similar, except that this time scale is different for uh, R2 experiment or T2 experiment. And then you get this fitted parameter from here. And for nosy, the analysis is going to be slightly different. There are only two experiments that you collected. So basically you're going to get the um, experiment with saturation and without uh, the pre-saturation you get the ratio of the same intensity and that is all, that is all you need to do. So you can even use Excel to process this. Um, and then you can get um, this value, which from which you can get your NOE enhancement. Um, so this is the overall idea of what we are trying to do here in this particular section. Um, so basically we will uh, collect, uh, we will process this data. I will show you how to do it using the Topspin Dynamic Center. Um, so there's no license that is required to run what I'm going to show you. Um, but <clears throat> if you want to do the whole analysis that is T1, T2, um, NOE analysis on top of that, you want to do your model free um, and all that, for that you probably require license. And uh, yeah, so, uh, so you can go to Brooker's website to look for it. And I'm also, also going to show you how you can process it using Sparky today. 
And uh, once you do the processing, um, you can get these values. Again, this is just a way to get you the data. You can use anything that you're comfortable with. If you like NMR effects, use that. If you like CCP and NMR, use that. Everything gives you intensity of peaks, right? That's all you care about in this analysis. And uh, then create uh, a text file with these values and uh, plot it with an easy equation. This is a very simple fitted equation, e to the power of something constant times um, uh, uh, the varying x, right? So that is your time period over here. And then you plot it as a function of time period. So that's all you're doing. So it's very, very simple. So I'm going to show you two different ways. So if you find some other way that you like, go ahead and do that. This is just um, how we, I, I'm going to go over uh, the different processes for doing this. Okay. Um, so let's now go back to top spin. Okay, so this is experiment number seven. So this is my T1 experiment, okay? Um, so this is run as a pseudo 3D experiment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is 248, uh, 2048 points in hydrogen, 128 in nitrogen and 12 points. And you can look up the different points that I have in there. Okay, so the easy way to actually um, uh, process this is then you just uh, go to, um, application, click on dynamics, and there is this thing called dynamics center, okay? Okay, um, so this is the one that you require the license for. So it'll do your T1, T2, NOE, and it'll get you your S square, your, the ones that I'm gonna show later. <clears throat> so basically in um, this, you can use this section, which is kind of a uh, free um, section of this particular dynamic center. So now let's process T1. So that's kind of, that corresponds to this experiment number seven, okay? So you double click on this, click on sample, uh, give it some name. So I will call it GB3. So that my report says that uh, this with the date, lab book number. So this is kind of useful when you have everything written in your lab book and you can refer back, okay? Um, then you click on data, it takes a while sometimes. Uh, so. I've already clicked it, so let's wait till the next window opens. Okay, there you go. So I have collected this as a function of uh, like a pseudo 3D experiment. So now I'm going to click on browse. Okay, um, then I go to data, go to that particular folder. So you would go to the folder that you collected your data on. Um, so let's go to experiment number seven. Go to P data, experiment number one, 3RR. Okay. So there are different options. So fully automated peak picking, you can use integrals, It'll, or if you have a list, you can use those lists. So here it's going to use a list of the mixing time that was in that experiment. And then um, it, it'll use as many spectra that are there in the list. Okay. Uh, so now you click on okay. So now it has already picked um, my, uh, my different uh, spectrums. Um, so now uh, it has already uh, given a name for these uh, peaks, so peak number one all the way to peak number 72. And then you can click on analysis. So we're just going to do some, the very simple analysis. So basically because there's a T1 experiment. So you start on a, a constant times e to the power of minus, uh, R2 times R1 times uh, the T. Um, so that is the default set of value. You click over that. It does error estimation uh, based on the fit. So I have a bunch of repeats in here as well. So you will see that in the data. And that is used for estimating the error. So some data looks great, some data look, doesn't look great. Uh, but yeah, the, that is how you process this. Okay, so the analysis is complete, it's actually pretty quick. So view, um, so you just select the default one. So you, I want to see the fitted curve. So you can say, okay. So let's make this a little bigger. Um, okay, so let me close this window. So let's just have two windows. So this is peak number one. So you see the fitted, the fitting looks great. 
Um, so there are, you see there are like three points over here, which means there are like three overlapped uh, um, signals for this particular peak. Uh, and this is plotted as a function of di different uh, mixing times that I use for our T1 experiment. Um, so this is for peak number two, peak number three, and this is that fitted T1 value. Okay, um, so basically in this case, you see the error is much bigger. Um, so this was uh, probably <laughs> a bad fit. Um, but yeah, so in order to get a better fit, it probably uh, you want to increase um, the, the number of scans um, or optimize um, the, the sample conditions such that you have much higher signal to noise. I'm guessing this uh, particular signal kind of like is very close to the noise. That is why you're getting um, the huge errors. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so this is how you would analyze each one of your peaks in your spectrum. Um, and uh, then you can actually uh, get these values. So you can click on report. Um, so you can just say temporary PDF, that's fine. Or you can give a name for this and you can click okay. Uh, it says, I already have a report. Can I overwrite? I'm like, yeah, please go ahead and overwrite. Um, so now it has selected which peaks are labeled one through whatever. And um, the position of the peaks, uh, the T1 value and the estimated error, okay? So this is all you care about, right? So all you care about is these values. And uh, this has done a very good job in creating this particular report. Again, you can print this out and put it in your notebook. And it's very, very useful and it also does the plots. Um, you can actually um, uh, go and see what these plots look like for the various regions of the, 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 the protein that you're interested in. Um, and then not only that, you can also export it as an Excel file. So you can then go ahead and create this. Uh, you can say include all parameters um, and then you can just say, okay. So now it's going to create an Excel file. So it says it's successfully created and you can use that Excel file to do our next step. So that is our um, estimation of S squared and stuff like that. So um, anyway, so that is how um, you can use this data that is out that has come out of this. So this was not all that difficult, right? You collected the data on top span, uh, you are able to analyze it. Uh, only thing that is in here that is troublesome is the, the the names that is one through 72. What does that mean, right? So for that you require assignments. So once you have the assignments, you can use uh, those lists uh, corresponding to uh, different regions of your protein. So you can, one could be like alanine 25. So you can say that is alanine 25. So that way uh, it's labeled appropriately. Okay, uh, for that you require assignments. That will be our next workshop. Uh, so yeah, we will really work on that. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. Let's do um, T2 analysis. Uh, again, the same thing. Um, so this is experiment number eight, okay? Um, GBV3, do this, click okay. Data takes a while to open, let's just wait. A little bit of patience on this software. It's not all that polished, um, but yeah. Okay, so we collected experiment number eight as a pseudo 3D. Uh, so now I'm going to click on browse, go to data. It's <coughs> number eight. Click on OK. There you go. So this, this data is here. Let's do the analysis. Uh, <clears throat> okay, this analysis is just uh, e to the power of minus t times t2, um, or t times r2. Um, so you can click okay, it's pretty quick. Then you can do a view so that you can <clears throat> have a visual of this. I'm just gonna close this middle window. <clears throat> there you go. <coughs> okay, so this is um, the T2 fitting uh, for uh, peak number one, T2 fitting for two, three, four, five, and stuff like that. Um, 
So let's, uh, again, you can create a report and stuff like that. So um, I'm just gonna call it test two. Okay. And it creates a report um, with your T2 values with the errors in it. Um, And then you can also export this as an Excel file. You can create, you can um, include all the parameters, click okay. So that's it. So now you have your T1 values and T2 values. And for Nosy, you would manually do it. There's nothing in here that can help you with uh, analyzing Nosy because it's just two experiments. Then it's just QC based experiment. So um, you can then use anything that you have used as QC for any software like Spotty or CCP and MR to actually analyze that particular data. But the difficult part is this, in that case, you're just looking for um, the ratio of intensities, right? So that is much easier for nosy, but for this, you have to do an exponential fit here. It does it, gets your error estimated and stuff like that. So I see there are two questions. So is it possible to label the peaks? And yes, you can label these peaks um, and you can do that in your, uh, so when I, I just clicked on next with next, so you can create a label and create a text file and those that text file can be used um, to actually uh, read into this particular analysis. Um, then there's another question. So did this, okay. Is it possible to transfer the assignments uh, into the dynamic center? So yes, you can. Um, yes, you can do that. So basically, um, you can transfer uh, the assignments and um, you, you, if you have it assigned using a different software, you can go into Topspin and create that file um, for that uh, using an HSQC based experiment and you can go and use that. And that way uh, these labels will have uh, the residue name on it rather than numbers from one through whatever. Um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, so this is actually uh, a very good example of how you should not collect data, you see this um, is not a good exponential fit. So uh, one of the questions was, how do you know this is a good data set, right? This is not a great data set. So this looks like a straight line. So this looks like, it's like this region of your exponential fit. Your exponential fit should look something like this. So in that case, you want to increase the number of, um, uh, you know, the sections over here uh, to actually um, cover more points on this side of uh, the fit. Um, so in this case, you rerun this experiment with less points here. You have way too many points in the initial relaxation value. So you want to like go and decrease that so that you get uh, maybe one point here, one point here, one point here and so on and so forth. So that is how you set this up. Again, the, the first time you run it may not be the best data set that you collected for your, your protein. So you want to come back and collect it. So what I usually recommend people to do is actually uh, collect just two points. Uh, so you collect one with the lowest number of uh, sections. So you collect this one section over there, then you collect the last point, okay? So then you can see how much of a difference that you're seeing, if there are there is enough difference, or if you are something like this, where the intensity doesn't change all that much, um, not by a factor of like 10, okay? So that, that is a logarithmic fit, right? So e to the power of something is a logarithmic fit. So this number should be 10 times as much as this, like here, right? So this number is 10 times as higher than this, right? So this is a good set of values. For this, uh, the T2, this is not a good set of values. So you run this experiment with this point and this point, so you don't waste a lot of time. You fit your values and if it looks good, then it's great. If it's not, um, then you can uh, run a point that is much farther down or a bigger number over there. And that way um, you are again optimizing for not heating up your sample and stuff like that, right? So yeah, so, so you have to run these uh, as a function of uh, like, uh, results that you see out of it, okay? Um, so yeah, so I, I intentionally kept this data set here to show you what a bad data set looks like, okay? When you're doing exponential fit, the change in value should be at least by a factor of 10, okay? Order, one, one order. If it's more than one order, that's great, that's awesome. And uh, this is probably um, also due to um, the um, the region in which this particular um, 
the 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 um the residue is present in so it could be like you know this guy is great so you can use this data set for this particular uh residue right but for that residue that we had terrible data for i'm guessing somewhere here um where it just looked like a straight line <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> this guy <clears throat> yeah so in, in this case this is not a good data set for this particular residue so you can analyze the data from every other residue that is giving you a, a good order of magnitude but then you don't want to use the data for that uh, residue that was uh, more of like a straight line okay so yeah so basically every set of these um um, time periods that you used in your experiment could uh, give you some useful data for certain sections of the protein. And for certain sections, you probably have to redo the whole thing because this is a 2D experiment. You can't just pick and choose which peaks you want to choose. So you have to collect everything. So you run this again as a function of a different set of these uh, variables. Okay, so this is how you would do it in, uh, in, in, um, in dynamic center. So now I'm going to switch to um, to Sparky, um, we will do the same kind of fit on Sparky as well. Um, again, um, if you don't like the fit fitting way of what these guys are doing, you can obviously export these values out in that Excel file, and then you can do it manually based on your fit, based uh, you, whatever fitting software that you are comfortable with. If you like MATLAB, go ahead and use it. This guy uh, gives you the raw data as well, so it gives you the height of peak of each and every one of these guys. So you can fit using any software that you like. Um, so you can um, extract that and use your software of interest as well. Okay, so I'm going to switch. So let me know if you have any questions about Dynamic Center. Again, I'm not an expert on Dynamic Center. Um, there's a good help in here as well. Um, the manual is great too. So you can, uh, you can then go and look up the manual. It's pretty, pretty extensive tells you the various capabilities of different sections in this particular dynamic center. Um, but yeah, um, okay. So I'm gonna close this. Okay, so that is how we directly analyzed using uh, dynamic center, okay. So let me know if you guys can see this. Okay, so Sparky uh, is uh, a software that I like. Um, so this was probably uh, first created in UCSF and now NMR fam um, has taken over maintaining it is, is I think now called NMR fam hyphen Sparky. Um, so uh, they have added a lot of useful tools and we're going to use one of those useful tools today, especially for doing our T1, T2 analysis. Um, I have done similar analysis using NMR view J. I think now that is called NMR FX. Again, the same thing. You can use any software that you are comfortable with. Okay, so I have just gone into this particular folder. I was just snooping through what is in here. So this is our experiment number seven. Okay, so process data in top spin is in P data uh, folder number one, and then you have three RR, right? So that is that is in there. Okay, so in in um, um, in this, there's also this file called VD list. So you can see more VD list. Um, so now you see these are the delays um, that I ran for our experiment, right? So uh, for our T1 experiments, I went all the way from 20 milliseconds all the way to 1,200 milliseconds, and I'm repeating 63 times repeating 600 milliseconds three times as well, okay? Um, so basically um, you would create this file that is at VD list and that is saved <clears throat> in this folder, okay? Um, so that is very important. Um, so once you find out what the content of this file is, um, we're going to um, use uh, the brook to ucsf command 
Um, I'm just showing you the history of the different commands that I uh, typed in here. You can write a script, whichever makes you comfortable, okay? Um, so um, for this, um, I have written a Topspin script. Um, so, okay, so you would load your experiment over here. So experiment number seven, right? So that is loaded. Then you type in this command, split, relax, two, three, okay? So this is a script that I wrote uh, for um, processing this data. So once you hit enter, it'll ask you for experiment number. So you can type in an experiment number over here. Um, so let's say 10,000, okay? Mm, click okay. <coughs> so 10,000 series, the first experiment is this guy, okay? So this is for the first delay. So that is the delay of, uh, what is it? 20 milliseconds, okay? So that is our first, there's 10,000 experiment is that delay, okay? Now let's go to 10,001 experiment. Um, so this particular experiment has a T1 delay of 60 milliseconds. So 10,002 experiment has a delay of, hundred and so on and so forth. So in this case, I should have um, 12 experiments over here, right? So yeah, so this is our last point. So this is the same point that is 600 millisecond of delay. So as you see, the you increase the, the time period, you're actually uh, increasing, um, uh, decreasing the intensity of these signals, okay? Um, so what I have done is I wrote a script that does this for us, that is it, took that pseudo 3D experiment, converted it into 2D experiment. And then you can go into each one of these folders. So you now if you get out of the seven folder and go into 10,000 folder, you can use your NMR pipe commands or spark key commands or stuff like that, right? So what I did is I just used brook to UCSF command. Um, so I split this seven experiment into 7,000, 7,001, 7,002, so on and so forth. So I type in this command, brook to UCSF, uh, 7,000 process data, experiment number one, two RR, because the 2D experiment, um, I split that pseudo 3D into 2D. So each one of these 7,000 experiment is in our case, I have the demo that I showed you was in 10,000 region, but 7,000 also has the same data. And that is my first data point. So 20 millisecond, so do that. Um, so 7,001 corresponds to 60 millisecond, 7,002 corresponds to 100 millisecond. You can write a script for this. Uh, just to be quick, I was able to just type in these commands and do it, okay? This is how you manually uh, create these files, okay? Um, <clears throat> for T2 experiments, you do the same thing. Um, so you have something called VD list. <coughs> so you also have something called uh, VC list, okay? Let's look at VC list. This is what actually I ran. Um, so the first point is one loop that corresponds to 16.9 milliseconds. Uh, then you have the second loop that corresponds to 34 milliseconds. Then you have the four, which corresponds to this. So top spin was smart enough that it took the values from my uh, variable counter list or VC list and converted to a variable delay list that we can directly use for fitting our data. So again, I did the exact same thing. I split this experiment number eight using the split relax uh, 2D uh, command that it's a script that I wrote. Um, so uh, yeah, so basically this is that first point. So that is this point of like 17 milliseconds. Um, so uh, if I go to experiment number five, so this will be much less intensity. And this corresponds to probably one, two, three, four, five, 170 milliseconds, right? Um, so basically that is how um, these experiments are um, split as 2D experiments that you can use anything that you're comfortable with and about effects, that's fine. And then you would use these commands. So in my case, I just use brook to UCSF, process data from top span into UCSF file. I just named it relax T2 with the corresponding delay. Okay, so basically I created my UCSF files and now I put those UCSF files into one folder. Um, so for Nosy, um, all I did is I just use the split command, right? So 
um, like you know for the nosy experiment. So let's open nosy. So you click on pulse prog, you go all the way to the bottom and tells you how to process it. Um, if it doesn't, yeah, you can use a split relax. Um, so this is run as a pseudo 3D experiment. Um, so you can do um, split relax um, 2D, the same command. Um, so that is, you just type in this, it'll ask you for um, a folder number. In this case, I just typed in 9,000. Uh, so it just created 9,000. The first experiment is going to be um, with NOE on. And uh, this was, how long was it? Oh, you can't tell me from here, I guess. Um, let me check how long this guy was. This was just a three hour experiment. Okay. So because I had much higher um, concentration of samples, so I was able to get away with less number of scans. So the, the 9,000 experiment is going to be with NOE on, that is with the saturation on, and the 9,001 experiment is going to be the one with no saturation, okay? So all you're trying to do is get the intensity of the peak from here, intensity of the peak from here, um, and all I did is just typed in two commands, so brook to ucsf 9,000, so that is with NOE on, brook to ucsf oh, I think I messed this up, so this should be, Nine thousand one, and I'm going to remove. UCSF. Let's just copy here. Okay, so now I have my NOE on and NOE off. I have my T one experiments and I have my T two experiments. Okay, so now let's open all this in Sparky. So basically, um, um, so you can just then just do your Sparky star T1 star. Uh, I don't know if you can look at uh, what I'm trying to show here, but yeah, you can type in star, uh, Sparky star T1 star and you can click enter. Um, so if you have Sparky installed on your computer, you can go ahead and use that. Or if you have Sparky, uh, if you want to use it, uh, I already have the NMR farm Sparky um, for um, on the spectrometers as well. So you can use the NMR farm Sparky that I have already installed. Okay, um, so basically now you can see there are like a whole bunch of different uh, windows over here, each one with a different delay file with my T1 period shown as, you know, uh, in milliseconds. So, um, Okay, so let's do this. Okay, <clears throat> so um, you can then use anything uh, that you're comfortable with. So let's, uh, for fun, just process one data. Um, so I'm just going to add, you know, this this particular peak. Uh, which one? Let's just select this guy. Okay. Um, Let's zoom in. I want to be at the center of the peak. So let's zoom in. Okay, at peak. Let's go add this guy. Okay. Um, okay. So you would do this. So if you have already done your assignments on, on the protein of interest, uh, you would have a name for this. Um, so let's go ahead and put a name so you can type in AT. Um, so that brings up this window. Uh, okay. So, so uh, I don't know the assignment of this. I'm just going to call this unknown one. But if you do, please go ahead and uh, enter the. Uh, the value uh, or the residue number for this. Um, so this case, this is a nitrogen. Um, this case is a hydrogen. Okay, so now you have this. Now if you type in LT, um, so it's going to say unknown one, or in your case, if it's like alanine something or glycine something, you can label that. 
So this will show this is at this particular corresponding time, uh, corresponding position. That is 108.572 ppm is your nitrogen chemical shift, and this is 8.756. Okay. Um, so let's say you want to get the intensity of the peaks for this particular um, peak in every one of this, right? So go back to Sparky, click on NMR fam, uh, click on. Um, so you can use peak height analysis. So you can click on perturbation analysis and then you hit uh, this, this particular command, peak height analysis. Uh, so then it brings up this. So basically these are your peaks um, or your signals that you have. Um, so if you have more than one signal, yeah, you can put in the, everything over here and that you can copy from your assignment. Uh, but once you have it over there, you can then, you know, click on update. Oh, before that I need to set up. So basically you click on set up, that brings out this window. So this experiment is a um, time parameter of point. Zero two zero, this is point six zero zero. So this is uh, 60, oh, this is 60. This is 100, which is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. So here is that delay list, right? So this is what I'm actually entering over here. Um, 0.6, okay, let's click okay. Now you see update, boom, there you go. So now it did do, do the fit. Um, so it gave, gave me a, a, a t, t, uh, one value of uh, 2.2, plus minus 1.5. And these were the different values that it got. So these are the intensity from the various spectrum that it got. Um, so then you can, I think, double click. And yeah, the plot looks terrible. But yeah, you, you can do a better fit. Uh, you, uh, you can do the fitting uh, based on uh, good initial values. And then you can use this to actually um, get your fitted parameter. But again, I maybe I just chose a wrong um, peak to start with, or maybe it's not centered. But yeah, um, you, you will do the pretty much the same kind of analysis that we did on um, the dynamic center. But yeah, this is how you would get these values. Um, so once you get it, um, you can then go ahead and like save them. Um, and then it will create a, a text file with the uh, intensities as well as um, the fitted value from which you can get your estimated T1, estimated T2. So for T2, you just repeat the same thing. You just pick a peak um, with the assigned values over there, and then you can get these intensities, fit them and get an error estimation and stuff like that. Um, for nosy, you do the exact same thing. There are only two experiments, um, just give two mixing times of zero. You don't care about the fitting. In that case, all you care about is this intensity for on and off, and then that file, you would just save it and then um, use that in uh, the fitting parameter file that I'm gonna show you to get your order parameter and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so this is how you process it in Sparky. Um, and um, yeah, if you do have the assignments, you would start with those assigned values over here, and then that will make your life a lot, lot easier. And then you can do these assignments. Oh, you get the T1, T2, and OE. Um,
So there is a comment that says RH. Yeah, so that, that's what we did, right? So yeah, so um, RH gives us a peak height analysis. Yeah, that's the one we did. Um, and then you can um, uh, do this kind of fitting. Okay, um, so <coughs> now that Sparky is done. So if you have any questions, let me know. Um, so again, to do the T2, you just do the same thing. You just do whatever steps I did. Uh, now it just opens the T2 experiments. Uh, you can open those, uh, those spectrum, do the analysis based on the various peak. And then you can use that particular extension that I showed you, uh, which is this RH that is the peak height analysis to actually do the fitting. Uh, but yeah, so um, let me know if there are any questions or we can move on to the next section. Okay, so let's do a quick theory of the order parameter using the model-free approach. Um, I don't expect everyone to understand what is going on here. Even when I read this paper the first time, I had no idea what they were talking about. So it's totally okay um, um, to, to approach this from a, like a, um, you know, very hands-off kind of approach. And I'm gonna show you how you can easily do that, okay? Um, but yeah, so basically I'm gonna give you a black box that you can directly use. Um, okay, uh, so basically um, Lipari and Zabo, um, they had this formalism where there's a correlation between the spectral density function and the overall motion. That's your uh, tau m or in what I was describing as tau c. And then there is something called internal motion. So those can be fitted and then you can get, so that is uh, tau m, tau e and order parameter. So basically um, if uh, the internal motion is very rapid, this guy goes to zero. Uh, if it is not present, then S squared approaches one. So it's pretty close to uh, one means you have rigid regions, pretty close to zero means um, it's highly flexible. Okay, but then you have other contribution, you have relaxation contributions, you have your T2, um, predicted T2 that is kind of affected based on these relaxation that are happening inside your protein that correspond to the various dynamic processes that happen inside your protein. Again, this is just a simple two state um, Lipati Zabo formalism. Okay, uh, if you read anything on our parameter, this is the first thing that everyone starts with. Um, so that's why I just wanted to put in this slide um, and give you the overall thing of what it means, okay, in this particular paper. Um, then there is this model-free approach, which is an extended Lipari-Zabo formalism. In this case, uh, you will have a few fitted, uh, few fitted parameters. Uh, one is your overall motion or your tumbling time. Then your tau e, which is your effective um, slow motion that is happening in the local regions. Um, and then, um, then you have your fast order parameter, then you have uh, order parameter for slow internal motion. So you have four fitted parameters. So you keep on adding more and more uh, parameters to fit uh, the complex things that proteins are. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of like, uh, um, extending the lipari zabo formalism to actually get uh, some information on certain really flexible regions and certain uh, uh, you know rigid regions which are defined by high order parameters. Um, so basically, um, this is very uh, useful for very uh, you know globular kind of proteins that are like um, uh, assumed uh, to like tumble very quickly and has um, fast motions in the different states. Again, this is just um, the, the first way of looking into the model-free approach. Um, and then um, in, the, in a paper by uh, Art Palmer, um, probably this is what uh, all reviews refer to. If you read any review on 
order parameter. This is the one that they refer to. And in this case, uh, you have your T1, T2, or, or R1, R2, NOE as a function of order parameters, which is uh, using those spectral density function, you can back calculate this order parameters. And um, that is the first. So um, here in the table, uh, you would see that um, you just fit for S square. It is great if your protein is very, you know, globular, you probably can get away with the first model, okay? Which is the simplified model. Um, you fit it, see how good or bad your fit is, then you can say, okay, I'm happy with it. Uh, my, my protein is very um, well behaved and I have no issues and uh, looks great. So a, a very good example of GB1 or GB3, right? Um, yeah, this will probably fit using model, the first model. Um, but then you add more complexities and you add your internal motion. So that's your tau E um, that can be fitted as well. So the second model, um, then you can have uh, REX. REX means that you can have a more um, relaxation between different states. Uh, then you can add the REX and tau E to combine this REX and tau E. And that is your model number four. Model number five is having something called a, a slow and fast along with tau E. So again, I'm just giving you an overview of what each model is when, I say, when someone reports it, hey, I used model one uh, of uh, model three to actually do my calculations. This is what they mean, okay? Um, and all data pretty much fit well. So most of the time I see that this is a good starting point. Uh, you can start with model two or model five. Those are the good starting points for various uh, fittings for protein of your interest, okay? Um, so the moment you see anything like this in a paper, this is what they're referring to. That's why you have the slide. You don't uh, have to know why um, this particular, uh, the, the theory behind it, but if you're interested, please go ahead and read the, the, the citations that I have put in this slide um, of what each model does, okay? Um, Okay, um, so basically uh, when someone says, hey, can you run model free for me? Um, you are doing the first thing is you're back calculating. So this is for model one, obviously. Um, so in this case, um, you're back calculating the spectral density function. Um, and uh, then what you can do is take your data and you calculate uh, this ratio, T1 over T2 um, or R1 over R2, one over that. Um, so, so basically, <coughs> excuse me. So basically, once you get this ratio, you can actually get the correlation time from it. Um, so once you plot it for your protein of interest, you can get um, how your protein is tumbling, okay? So pretty much everything, if it tumbles um, evenly, you will have an even value of your uh, T1 over uh, T2. If it doesn't tumble even, let's say you have these like tails, acidic tail that is kind of like interacting with itself. You're going to see that those tails or the regions that are very, very different, they will have very different ratios and that can be easily um, taken out of your calculation for the correlation time because for model three, you require some approximation based on the correlation time. So if you don't have a good estimate of this, so other thing you can do is you can uh, uh, look into the PDB of uh, the protein. So if there are crystallographers who have already uh, uh, obtained the structure of your protein, or if you have NMR approaches to actually uh, do your structural calculation, you can then use that PDB to back calculate your uh, correlation time. Because PDB, you can just, uh, you know the 3D structure, right? So based on that, you can find out what is the tumbling uh, time that it takes. Um, it's an either or, so use this or use this. Um, and this is a good estimate. So why you require this is, oh, is this guy goes in here so that you can back calculate your spectral density function. And once you do that, uh, you know this. So basically all that goes into your fitted values of your T1 over T2. Um, and then from uh, based on the model that you select, you can then get your uh, fitted values for your tau M, tau E, S square, SF, and SS, okay? 
Um, so this is, this is, these are the different steps in your model free, okay? Uh, like an overall step of what you're actually doing. But again, um, I'm going to give you a black box. So basically it is very well documented and you can just use it. Um, but yeah, I'm just putting the slide and the references. So just in case, if you're interested in what any of this means, you can go and read these papers, uh, like very, very descriptive and wonderfully written papers. Um, okay, so now I'm going to show you a, like a generalized uh, slide over here. Um, so basically, again, you, you get these values and then um, this is pretty much the relationship between the S square and the angle between the vectors. So in this case, let's say we are looking at N and H, right? So that is this guy. So we are looking at this bond vector that is your the bond between the nitrogen and hydrogen. And the S square is pretty much giving us the idea of what the size of this cone is. That is how much of this is actually being explored um, uh, by, the, by the protein. So basically what it means is that when this cone is like very, very small, let's say it's only this much, then that corresponds to this region. So that means that that region of your protein is very, very rigid. And if this cone is very, very broad, uh, so it's probably this vector is here, 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 it could be anywhere, right? So that means that this will have a lower S square. Um, so, so, so basically just from getting this S square, you can get like a top, uh, like information on, oh, this is probably uh, very dynamic or probably very, very rigid just by looking at a square and tau E gives you the internal motion. So that will give you information of how much of this is like moving between it. Just thinking of it like a jitter or something like that. Um, so those are the things that you can uh, get from doing this analysis. Um, and then finally, if you do get your order parameter, there is a relationship between entropy and order parameter. So the more um, dynamic something is, or if there is more entropy, you're gonna have a smaller order parameter. If there is um, higher entropy, um, yeah, you, you, it's probably more chaotic. So you're gonna get lower order parameter from that. But yeah, so this is that paper from Raphael. Um, and you can read this paper on figuring out how you can get entropic information from order parameters that you calculate from these model free analysis. Okay, um, so this is an example of uh, what a, a, a T1, T2 and uh, NOE experiment looks like over here. Um, so this, this particular section. Um, so once you use the fitting, you can get this S square uh, for this example set. So basically these are like the loop regions. Uh, so they are like very dynamic. So for that, the values are much lower as compared to the rigid region of the protein, so over here. So this is more of the, the well-folded core, and these are probably um, the, the dynamic regions um, just uh, from the, uh, the data that they obtain based on a T1, T2, and NOE. Um, then, um, then you have the contribution of REX uh, to the T2, so the higher enhanced T2 that you see over here, um, so that corresponds uh, to something um, that contributes uh, uh, to the internal motion of those residues. And then you have uh, enhanced uh, um, internal motion that is your tau E. Uh, if, you have, if you see a higher value as compared to everything else that is in this region, you can uh, say that these are exhibiting fast internal motions, these regions of the protein. So this is how useful this data is. Um, so once you do this uh, model-free analysis, you can um, get these kind of inferences from this S2 and uh, S square and, uh, and tau E. Um, and uh, next I'm gonna show you a black box of uh, a demo of doing this uh, data fitting. Um, so if you have any questions until now uh, regarding model-free, let me know. I know it's a very, you know, very, very difficult topic to approach this, but yeah. Uh, so what you're trying to get is um, <clears throat> is this. This is your ultimate goal. So once you collect your T1, T2, and OE, you analyze it, um, and then you can get these S square values and S square values are something like um, the like uh, crystallographers have this beta B, beta factor uh, number that is uncertainty in the crystal structure calculations that they have. Um, so this is something like that. So basically 
we are getting that kind of information like, okay, this is probably dynamic and this is directly um, observed in that um, NMR tube of my sample or your sample that you have inside the NMR spectrometer. So, so, so that is what, uh, this is the gist of what Model Freak gives you is getting your information on this uh, enhanced T2, that is your relaxation between uh, residues as well as um, very rigid regions, very flexible regions. So you can also do this because uh, the model free doesn't care about, um, so again, the PDB is just used for calculating the tau C, right? So which means that you can just use T1 over T2 to estimate your tau C, and uh, which also means you can also do this calculation for uh, disordered proteins. So most of the disordered proteins will probably lie in this region and any kind of order will probably be higher and you can actually get those information from um, the disorder proteins as well. So we have approaches to actually get that kind of information for, um, for disorder proteins. We have carbon detected techniques to get your T1, T2, NOE for disordered proteins as well. So that is more advanced. So let me know if that is something that you want to run. Um, and I have pulse sequences that we can set it up for you. And that'll be a completely different uh, training. But the idea behind it remains the same. You're measuring the nitrogen T1, nitrogen T2, and uh, effect of hydrogen on the nitrogen relaxation in your um, you know, disorder protein. Yeah, you, you'll probably do the same kind of analysis. Um, so yeah, so if you have any questions, let me know or else um, in the last section, I don't know how many minutes, um, I will show you the black box and probably if you have time, you can set it up and I will show you what it looks like. And uh, it's not all that difficult to run these model free analysis. So I'll wait another five seconds. If someone has any question, they can type in or raise your hand or want to talk, let me know, or we can move on to the last section of today's workshop. Um, okay, so let's do the demo. Um, so I'm going to use NMR Relax. Um, so you can go to this particular website, <coughs> nmr-relax.com, and it has all the instructions on how to set it up. Um, it took me a few hours to set it up because Python 2.7 is no longer <laughs> a common Python to find. Uh, you, you probably would find Python 3 and above. Um, but this uh, is free open source. If you have the ability to code in Python 3, please go ahead and help these guys out and convert this particular project to Python 3 code. And these are all the different um, resources that you can use. Um, and um, they, uh, the references are in this slide. And you can go ahead and read these papers to uh, get an idea of what I'm going to show you. Okay, so I'm going to uh, close this. This is my last slide over here, and I'm going to show you a demo of NMR Relax. Um, Okay, so I have a Windows machine. So this is a VS Code that I, I love to use. Um, so uh, basically um, in this case, I installed Python and uh, the libraries that they wanted. So there's a GUI interface. Um, and uh, you can, again, you can go to this particular website um, to actually see um, how to set it up and stuff like that. Um, if you're not comfortable, let me know. I can um, um, set it up on one of the spectrometers or the analysis computer. Um, if you also have access to um, um, NMR box, they have this already set up for you. So if you want to copy your data there, that's fine. So I downloaded um, the uh, particular OMP um, uh, protein that uh, they have uh, data on. And let me show you the data that they have, okay? So basically there is a PDB file. Um, so the PDB file um, is this. So let me do new share. Let me show. Yeah, so this is the protein of interest. So basically it's a, it's a crystallized dimer. Um, so there are, 
two alpha helices uh, and some beta sheets. Um, so the, uh, they are kind of like um, um, very well folded in certain regions. And then there are a lot of loops and a lot of uh, flexible regions as well. So this is uh, one of the demos that uh, they, they, um, they provide that is this NMR Relax. Um, so let's, let's go back and let me show you. Um, so let's look at the data that they have. So this is what the data looks like. So you put your residue name, a residue number, and then you put your T1 or R1 value, uh, T2 or R2 value, NOE value. So they have collected the same data set at two different field strengths. So in this case, they collected at 600 megahertz and they also collected the same data at 800 megahertz, okay? So these are those uh, values that you probably got from Dynamic Center or from Sparky or anything, um, any other software that you use to get these values. And then you put it in here, you can use uh, Excel file uh, to actually generate this or write your own scripts or learn Python or any software that you're comfortable with to create this file. So this file looks very simple, right? So all you care about is these uh, T1, T2 NOE at two different field strands and you put it in this text file. You can use a text editor to create this. So again, um, this, is, this is what this file looks like and then you put the PDB. And this is that black box that I was talking about. Uh, so let me... How do I... Okay. Zoom controls are in the middle of my screen. Okay, there you go, okay. Uh, okay, so um, the, these are the references that I was talking about. This is from um, NMR um, Relax. Um, and then you have your model one, model two, model three, model four, model five. So that is what uh, those models that I talked about in those slides. Um, and then uh, you can um, see what uh, the details on what, what each of these model does, okay? Um, and this is like an automated protocol. So, uh, so this particular um, authors of the paper, that is the paper, the first paper that they refer over here, you can go read this paper. Um, so they talk about what they actually do. So they actually um, do each one of this model and uh, they do a uh, Monte Carlo simulation with 200 points. Um, they do, um, you know, the optimization is based on, um, on uh, Newton's um, uh, regression model. Uh, so uh, you can do a grid search. Here is the number of increments per dimension. So you can go and change this. And uh, this is kind of the black box. And what it does is it reads the R1 value, R2 value, NOEs from the rate files and it reads the PDB file as well. Um, and then uh, based on that, it actually does this calculation. So it goes and uh, runs the first model, second model, third, fourth, fifth. And it took um, around six hours to do everything. Um, so for this particular calculation. So once you have everything, all these rates set up, all the PDB, if you don't have PDB, you can skip that, those lines in this black box. Uh, you can say, hey, just you know, comment out these lines. You can just say, read these values, and then you can do the fit, okay? Um, so once you do that, uh, it, it took six hours, and then it gave me the a square, so right over here. So you see over the ends, uh, the, the order parameters are um, around 0.7, much lower than uh, around 0.9 values that are for the middle regions of the protein, 0 0.9, 0 0.8. Um, certain regions are 0.55. So I'm guessing this particular region is highly flexible. Um, and then probably the ends will also have much lower values. So yeah, so this is around 0.75. So this is the end of the protein. So basically um, after six hours, it did the whole analysis, did all these uh, fitting into these models, found the best model for our, um, our data and then it spit out this particular values. And what you can do is uh, use this. Uh, you can use this to plot it. So this is a S squared, this is our error, and then use these uh, in your publication. Use any software that can plot these two values um, as a function of residues, and that can be used to actually um, 
infer on the various sections of, of the protein. Um, so yeah, so this is that black box that I was talking about. Let me know if you have um, any specific questions based on this. Um, but yeah, so the theory that I showed you is just being done in the background over here, okay? Um, so it, it'll take care of running those models and spit, spit out your, you know, so this is your, um, the fast rate, uh, this is your slow rate, uh, this is your tau E, uh, this is your tau F, this is your tau S. So each one of these is your output of your, you know, of your analysis. So yeah, so that, that is what, so see there's a question. Yeah, there is a GUI. Um, yeah, uh, the, it, it's not working. <laughs> yeah, I wish I had better news for you. Uh, so um, yeah, the, yeah, unfortunately um, the GUI just hangs. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, the GUI was uh, designed wherein you can do this manually. You just um, um, open the GUI, open, uh, and then um, <clears throat> you can load the various sections. Um, that is the rate values. And from there you can uh, back calculate your S square and you can do your T1, T2 fitting and all that stuff. You can do even other kind of fits. You can do relaxation dispersion fits and stuff like that. Um, so they use uh, something called WX Python, which is the GUI and is way too old for um, the version that they have it compiled for. Uh, so if you do want to use it, go to NMR box and they have a GUI version. So I was not able to use it. So yeah, you're right. So um, yeah, unfortunately um, yeah. <laughs> we don't have a working, working version of the GUI. Um, so that's it. So that's the end of this. So let me know if there are other questions. Yeah, so that's my last slide and those are the references. So, um, Uh, so there is a question that says NMR box is GUI. Uh, no, so NMR box is uh, um, access to a computer in University of Connecticut. Um, it's a, it's it's um, it's a it's a virtual computer, and you can um, you can like SSH into it. You can look into the GUI. It just it, so you will use the same VNC viewer that you use to connect to our spectrometers. Um, so basically, um, yeah, so basically uh, you would um, remote connect there, you will use the software just like um, you were sitting on your computer and uh, you can type in NMR, uh, you can type in relax minus minus GUI and it'll open the GUI. So yeah, so that, so yeah, so the version that I showed you is just a, a command line version. So I just type in NMR relax I can actually show you exact command that I uh, typed in. Um, so yeah, th this is just my setup. And uh, uh, let me see. This side. Yeah, so this is what I ran. So I just ran Python relax.py and then I entered the Python uh, code. So yeah, so I did not use the GUI. I used the, the commands that were, um, you know, the, the, use the Python script that is supplied with the um, with the software. Um, 